The Kashmir conflict is a territorial conflict primarily between India and Pakistan, having started just after the partition of India in 1947. China has at times played a minor role. India and Pakistan have fought three wars over Kashmir, including the Indo-Pakistani Wars of 1947 and 1965, as well as the Kargil War of 1999. The two countries have also been involved in several skirmishes over control of the Siachen Glacier. India claims the entire princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, and, as of 2010, administers approximately 43% of the region. It controls Jammu, the Kashmir Valley, Ladakh, and the Siachen Glacier. India's claims are contested by Pakistan, which administers approximately 37% of the region, namely Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. China currently administers the remaining 20% mostly uninhabited areas, the Shakskam Valley, and the Aksai Chin region. The present conflict is in Kashmir Valley. The root of conflict between the Kashmiri insurgents and the Indian government is tied to a dispute over local autonomy and based on the demand for self-determination. Democratic development was limited in Kashmir until the late 1970s, and by 1988, many of the democratic reforms introduced by the Indian government had been reversed. Nonviolent channels for expressing discontent were thereafter limited and caused a dramatic increase in support for insurgents advocating violent secession from India. In 1987, a disputed state election created a catalyst for the insurgency when it resulted in some of the state's legislative assembly members forming armed insurgent groups. In July 1988 a series of demonstrations, strikes and attacks on the Indian government began the Kashmir insurgency. Although thousands of people have died as a result of the turmoil in Jammu and Kashmir, the conflict has become less deadly in recent years. Protest movements created to voice Kashmir's disputes and grievances with the Indian government, specifically the Indian military, have been active in Jammu and Kashmir since 1989. Elections held in 2008 were generally regarded as fair by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and had a high voter turnout in spite of calls by separatist militants for a boycott. The election resulted in the creation of the pro-India Jammu and Kashmir National Conference, which then formed a government in the state. According to Voice of America, many analysts have interpreted the high voter turnout in this election as a sign that the people of Kashmir endorsed Indian rule in the state. But in 2010 unrest erupted after alleged fake encounter of local youth with security force. Thousands of youths pelted security forces with rocks, burned government offices and attacked railway stations and official vehicles in steadily intensifying violence. The Indian government blamed separatists and Lashkar-e-Taiba, a Pakistan-based militant group for stoking the 2010 protests. Elections held in 2014 saw highest voters turnout in 26 years of history in Jammu and Kashmir. However, analysts explain that the high voter turnout in Kashmir is not an endorsement of Indian rule by the Kashmiri population, rather most people vote for daily issues such as food and electricity. An opinion poll conducted by the Chatham House International Affairs think tank found that in the Kashmir Valley, the mainly Muslim area in Indian Kashmir at the center of the insurgency, support for independence varies between 74% to 95% in its various districts. Support for remaining with India was, however, extremely high in predominantly Hindu Jammu and Buddhist Ladakh. According to scholars, Indian forces have committed many human rights abuses and acts of terror against Kashmiri civilian population including extrajudicial killing, rape, torture and enforced disappearances. Crimes by militants have also happened but are not comparable in scale with the crimes of Indian forces. According to Amnesty International, as of June 2015, no member of the Indian military deployed in Jammu and Kashmir has been tried for human rights violations in a civilian court, although there have been military court-martials held. Amnesty International welcomed this move but cautioned that justice should be consistently delivered and prosecutions of security forces personnel be held in civilian courts. Amnesty International has also accused the Indian government of refusing to prosecute perpetrators of abuses in the region. Kashmir's accession to India was provisional and conditional on a plebiscite, and for this reason had a different constitutional status to other Indian states. In October 2015, Jammu and Kashmir High Court said that Article 370 is permanent 
and Jammu and Kashmir did not merge with India the way other princely states merged but retained special status and limited sovereignty under Indian constitution. In 2016, the 8th of July 2016 present unrest erupted after killing of a Hizbul Mujahideen militant Burhan Wani by Indian security forces. Topic: <laughs> India Pakistan conflict. Early history According to the mid-12th century text Rajatarangini the Kashmir Valley was formerly a lake. Hindu mythology relates that the lake was drained by the sage Kashyapa, by cutting a gap in the hills at Baramula and invited Brahmins to settle there. This remains the local tradition and Kashyapa is connected with the draining of the lake in traditional histories. The chief town or collection of dwellings in the valley is called Kashyapapura, which has been identified as ancient Greek, Kaspapyros Kaspapyros in Hecateus a Pud Stephanus of Byzantium and the Kaspatyros of Herodotus 4.44. Kashmir is also believed to be the country indicated by Ptolemy Kaspiria. The Pashtun Durrani Empire ruled Kashmir in the 18th century until its 1819 conquest by the Sikh ruler Ranjit Singh. The Raja of Jammu Gulab Singh, who was a vassal of the Sikh Empire and an influential noble in the Sikh court, sent expeditions to various border kingdoms and ended up encircling Kashmir by 1840. Following the First Anglo-Sikh War 1845 Kashmir was ceded under the Treaty of Lahore to the East India Company, which transferred it to Gulab Singh through the Treaty of Amritsar, in return for the payment of indemnity owed by the Sikh Empire. Gulab Singh took the title of the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. From then until the 1947 partition of India, Kashmir was ruled by the Maharajas of the princely state of Kashmir and Jammu. According to the 1941 census, the state's population was 77% Muslim, 20% Hindu and 3% others Sikhs and Buddhists. Despite its Muslim majority, the princely rule was an overwhelmingly Hindu state. The Muslim majority suffered under Hindu rule with high taxes and discrimination. Topic: <laughs> Partition and Invasion. British rule in the Indian subcontinent ended in 1947 with the creation of new states, the Dominion of Pakistan and the Union of India, as the successor states to British India. The British paramountcy over the 562 Indian princely states ended. According to the Indian Independence Act 1947, "...the suzerainty of His Majesty over the Indian states lapses, and with it, all treaties and agreements in force at the date of the passing of this Act between His Majesty and the rulers of Indian states." States were thereafter left to choose whether to join India or Pakistan or to remain independent. Jammu and Kashmir, the largest of the princely states, had a predominantly Muslim population ruled by the Hindu Maharaja Hari Singh. He decided to stay independent because he expected that the state's Muslims would be unhappy with accession to India, and the Hindus and Sikhs would become vulnerable if he joined Pakistan. On the 11th of August, the Maharaja dismissed his Prime Minister Ram Chandra Kak, who had advocated independence. Observers and scholars interpret this action as a tilt towards accession to India. Pakistanis decided to preempt this possibility by wresting Kashmir by force if necessary. Pakistan made various efforts to persuade the Maharaja of Kashmir to join Pakistan. In July 1947, Muhammad Ali Jinnah is believed to have written to the Maharaja promising every sort of favorable treatment, followed by the lobbying of the state's prime minister by leaders of Jinnah's Muslim League party. Faced with the Maharaja's indecision on accession, the Muslim League agents clandestinely worked in Poonch to encourage the local Muslims to an armed revolt, exploiting an internal unrest regarding economic grievances. The authorities in Pakistani Punjab waged a private war by obstructing supplies of fuel and essential commodities to the state. Later in September, Muslim League officials in the northwest frontier province, including the chief minister Abdul Qayyum Khan, assisted and possibly organized a large-scale invasion of Kashmir by Pathan tribesmen. Several sources indicate that the plans were finalized on 12 September by the Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan, based on proposals prepared by Colonel Akbar Khan and Sardar Shahkat Hayat Khan. 
One plan called for organizing an armed insurgency in the western districts of the state and the other for organizing a Pashtun tribal invasion. Both were set in motion. The Jammu division of the state got caught up in the partition violence. Large numbers of Hindus and Sikhs from Rawalpindi and Sialkot started arriving in March 1947, bringing harrowing stories of Muslim atrocities. This provoked counter violence on Jammu Muslims, which had many parallels with that in Sialkot. According to scholar Ilyas Chatha, the violence in the eastern districts of Jammu that started in September, developed into a widespread massacre of Muslims around the October, organized by the Hindu Dagra troops of the state and perpetrated by the local Hindus, including members of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, and the Hindus and Sikhs displaced from the neighboring areas of West Pakistan. The Maharaja himself was implicated in some instances. A large number of Muslims were killed. Huge number of Muslims have fled to West Pakistan, some of whom made their way to the western districts of Poonch and Mirpur, which were undergoing rebellion. Many of these Muslims believed that the Maharaja ordered the killings in Jammu and instigated the Muslims in West Pakistan to join the uprising in Poonch and help in the formation of the Azad Kashmir government. The rebel forces in the western districts of Jammu got organized under the leadership of Sardar Ibrahim, a Muslim conference leader. They took control of most of the western parts of the state by the 22nd of October. On the 24th of October, they formed a provisional Azad Kashmir Free Kashmir government based in Palandri. Topic: <coughs> Accession. Justice Mayor Chand Mahajan, the Maharaja's nominee for his next Prime Minister, visited Nehru and Patel in Delhi on 19 September, requesting essential supplies which had been blockaded by Pakistan since the beginning of September. He communicated the Maharaja's willingness to accede to India. Nehru, however, demanded that the jailed political leader, Sheikh Abdullah, be released from prison and involved in the state government. Only then would he allow the state to accede. The Maharaja released Sheikh Abdullah on 29 September. Before any further reforms were implemented, the Pakistani tribal invasion brought the matters to a head. Maharaja's troops, heavily outnumbered and outgunned and facing internal rebellions from Muslim troops, had no chance of withstanding the attack. The Maharaja made an urgent plea to Delhi for military assistance. Upon the Governor-General Lord Mountbatten's insistence, India required the Maharaja to accede before it could send troops. Accordingly, the Maharaja signed an instrument of accession on 26 October 1947, which was accepted by the Governor-General the next day. While the Government of India accepted the accession, it added the proviso that it would be submitted to a reference to the people after the state is cleared of the invaders, since only the people, not the Maharaja, could decide where Kashmiris wanted to live. It was a provisional accession, national conference, the largest political party in the state and headed by Sheikh Abdullah, endorsed the accession. In the words of the national conference leader Syed Mir Qasim, India had the legal, as well as moral, justification to send in the army through the Maharaja's accession and the people's support of it. The Indian troops, which were airlifted in the early hours of 27 October, secured the Srinagar airport. The city of Srinagar was being patrolled by the National Conference volunteers with Hindus and Sikhs moving about freely among Muslims, an incredible sight to visiting journalists. The National Conference also worked with the Indian Army to secure the city. In the north of the state lay the Gilgit Agency, which had been leased by British India but returned to the Maharaja shortly before independence. Gilgit's population did not favour the state's accession to India. Sensing their discontent, Major William Brown, the Maharaja's commander of the Gilgit Scouts, mutinied on 1 November 1947, overthrowing the governor Gansara Singh. The bloodless coup d'état was planned by Brown to the last detail under the code name Data Kel. Local leaders in Gilgit formed a provisional government Abari Hakoamat, naming Raja Shah Rais Khan as the president and Mirza Hassan Khan as the commander-in-chief. But, Major Brown had already telegraphed Khan Abdul Qayyum Khan asking Pakistan to take over. According to historian Yaqub Khan Bangish, the provisional government lacked sway over the population which had intense pro-Pakistan sentiments. Pakistan's political agent, Khan Muhammad Alam Khan, arrived on 16 November and took over the administration of Gilgit. 
According to various scholars, the people of Gilgit as well as those of Chilas, Ko Ghizr, Ishkaman, Yasin, Puniel, Hunza, and Nagar joined Pakistan by choice. Indo Pakistani War of 1947 Rebel forces from the western districts of the state and the Pakistani Pakhtun tribesmen made rapid advances into the Baramulla sector. In the Kashmir Valley, National Conference volunteers worked with the Indian Army to drive out the raiders. The resulting First Kashmir War lasted until the end of 1948. The Pakistan Army made available arms, ammunition and supplies to the rebel forces who were dubbed the Azad Army. Pakistani army officers conveniently on leave and the former officers of the Indian National Army were recruited to command the forces. In May 1948, the Pakistani army officially entered the conflict, in theory to defend the Pakistan borders, but it made plans to push towards Jammu and cut the lines of communications of the Indian forces in the Mendar Valley. See, Christine Fair notes that this was the beginning of Pakistan using irregular forces and asymmetric warfare to ensure plausible deniability, which has continued ever since. On 1 November 1947, Mountbatten flew to Lahore for a conference with Jinnah, proposing that, in all the princely states where the ruler did not accede to a dominion corresponding to the majority population, which would have included Junagadh, Hyderabad, as well as Kashmir, the accession should be decided by an impartial reference to the will of the people. Jinnah rejected the offer. According to Indian scholar A. G. Norani Jinnah ended up squandering his leverage. According to Jinnah, India acquired the accession through fraud and violence. A plebiscite was unnecessary and states should accede according to their majority population. He was willing to urge Junagadh to accede to India in return for Kashmir. For a plebiscite, Jinnah demanded simultaneous troop withdrawal for he felt that the average Muslim would never have the courage to vote for Pakistan in the presence of Indian troops and with Sheikh Abdullah in power. When Mountbatten countered that the plebiscite could be conducted by the United Nations, Jinnah, hoping that the invasion would succeed and Pakistan might lose a plebiscite, again rejected the proposal, stating that the governors generals should conduct it instead. Mountbatten noted that it was untenable given his constitutional position and India did not accept Jinnah's demand of removing Sheikh Abdullah. Prime Ministers Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan met again in December, when Nehru informed Khan of India's intention to refer the dispute to the United Nations under Article 35 of the UN Charter, which allows the member states to bring to the Security Council attention situations likely to endanger the maintenance of international peace. Nehru and other Indian leaders were afraid since 1947 that the temporary accession to India might act as an irritant to the bulk of the Muslims of Kashmir. Secretary in Patel's Ministry of States, V.P. Menon, admitted in an interview in 1964 that India had been absolutely dishonest on the issue of plebiscite. A. G. Norani blames many Indian and Pakistani leaders for the misery of Kashmiri people but says that Nehru was the main culprit. UN mediation India sought resolution of the issue at the UN Security Council, despite Sheikh Abdullah's opposition to it. Following the setup of the United Nations Commission for India and Pakistan UNCIP, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 47 on 21 April 1948. The measure called for an immediate ceasefire and called on the government of Pakistan to secure the withdrawal from the state of Jammu and Kashmir of tribesmen and Pakistani nationals not normally resident therein who have entered the state for the purpose of fighting. It also asked government of India to reduce its forces to minimum strength, after which the circumstances for holding a plebiscite should be put into effect on the question of accession of the state to India or Pakistan. However, it was not until the 1st of January 1949 that the ceasefire could be put into effect, signed by General Douglas Gracie on behalf of Pakistan and General Roy Booker on behalf of India. However, both India and Pakistan failed to arrive at a truce agreement due to differences over interpretation of the procedure for and the extent of demilitarization. One sticking point was whether the Azad Kashmiri army was to be disbanded during the truce stage or at the plebiscite stage. The UNCIP made three visits to the subcontinent between 1948 and 1949, trying to find a solution agreeable to both India and Pakistan. It reported to the Security Council in August 1948 that the presence of troops of Pakistan 
Inside Kashmir represented a material change in the situation. A two part process was proposed for the withdrawal of forces. In the first part, Pakistan was to withdraw its forces as well as other Pakistani nationals from the state. In the second part, when the Commission shall have notified the Government of India that Pakistani withdrawal has been completed, India was to withdraw the bulk of its forces. After both the withdrawals were completed, a plebiscite would be held. The resolution was accepted by India but effectively rejected by Pakistan. The Indian government considered itself to be under legal possession of Jammu and Kashmir by virtue of the accession of the state. The assistance given by Pakistan to the rebel forces and the Pakhtun tribes was held to be a hostile act and the further involvement of the Pakistan army was taken to be an invasion of Indian territory. From the Indian perspective, the plebiscite was meant to confirm the accession, which was in all respects already complete, and Pakistan could not aspire to an equal footing with India in the contest. The Pakistan government held that the state of Jammu and Kashmir had executed a standstill agreement with Pakistan, which precluded it from entering into agreements with other countries. It also held that the Maharaja had no authority left to execute accession because his people had revolted and he had to flee the capital. It believed that the Azad Kashmir movement as well as the tribal incursions were indigenous and spontaneous, and Pakistan's assistance to them was not open to criticism. In short, India required an asymmetric treatment of the two countries in the withdrawal arrangements, regarding Pakistan as an aggressor, whereas Pakistan insisted on parity. The UN mediators tended towards parity, which was not to India's satisfaction. In the end, no withdrawal was ever carried out, India insisting that Pakistan had to withdraw first, and Pakistan contending that there was no guarantee that India would withdraw afterwards. No agreement could be reached between the two countries on the process of demilitarization, Cold War historian Robert J. McMahon states that American officials increasingly blamed India for rejecting various UNCIP truce proposals under various dubious legal technicalities just to avoid a plebiscite. McMahon adds that they were right since a Muslim majority made a vote to join Pakistan the most likely outcome and postponing the plebiscite would serve India's interests. Scholars have commented that the failure of the Security Council efforts of mediation owed to the fact that the council regarded the issue as a purely political dispute without investigating its legal underpinnings. Declassified British papers indicate that Britain and US had let their Cold War calculations influence their policy in the UN, disregarding the merits of the case. Dixon Plan The UNCIP appointed its successor, Sir Owen Dixon, to implement demilitarization prior to a statewide plebiscite on the basis of General McNaughton's scheme, and to recommend solutions to the two governments. Dixon's efforts for a statewide plebiscite came to naught due to India's constant rejection of the various alternative demilitarization proposals, for which Dixon rebuked India harshly. Dixon then offered an alternative proposal, widely known as the Dixon Plan. Dixon did not view the state of Jammu and Kashmir as one homogeneous unit and therefore proposed that a plebiscite be limited to the valley. Dixon agreed that people in Jammu and Ladakh were clearly in favor of India, equally clearly, those in Azad Kashmir and the northern areas wanted to be part of Pakistan. This left the Kashmir Valley and, perhaps some adjacent country, around Muzaffarabad in uncertain political terrain. Pakistan did not accept this plan because it believed that India's commitment to a plebiscite for the whole state should not be abandoned. Dixon also had concerns that the Kashmiris, not being high spirited people, may vote under fear or improper influences. Following Pakistan's objections, he proposed that Sheikh Abdullah administration should be held in commission in abeyance while the plebiscite was held. This was not acceptable to India, which rejected the Dixon plan. Another grounds for India's rejection of the limited plebiscite was that it wanted Indian troops to remain in Kashmir for security purposes, but would not allow Pakistani troops the same. However, Dixon's plan had encapsulated a withdrawal by both sides. Dixon had believed a neutral administration would be essential for a fair plebiscite. Dixon came to the conclusion that India would never agree to conditions and a demilitarization which would ensure a free and fair plebiscite. Dixon's failure also compounded American Ambassador Loy Henderson's misgivings about Indian sincerity and he advised the U.S. to maintain a distance from the Kashmir dispute, which the U.S. subsequently did, and leave the matter for Commonwealth nations to intervene in. Topic. 
1950 military standoff The convening of the Constituent Assembly in Indian Kashmir in July 1950 proved contentious. Pakistan protested to the Security Council which informed India that this development conflicted with the party's commitments. The National Conference rejected this resolution and Nehru supported this by telling Dr. Graham that he would receive no help in implementing the resolution. A month later Nehru adopted a more conciliatory attitude, telling a press conference that the Assembly's actions would not affect India's plebiscite commitment. The delay caused frustration in Pakistan and Zafrullah Khan went on to say that Pakistan was not keeping a warlike mentality but did not know what Indian intransigence would lead Pakistan and its people to. India accused Pakistan of ceasefire violations and Nehru complained of warmongering propaganda in Pakistan. On 15 July 1951 the Pakistani Prime Minister complained that the bulk of the Indian Army was concentrated on the Indo-Pakistan border. The Prime Ministers of the two countries exchanged telegrams accusing each other of bad intentions. Liaquat Ali Khan rejected Nehru's charge of warmongering propaganda. Khan called it a distortion of the Pakistani press's discontent with India over its persistence in not holding a plebiscite and a misrepresentation of the desire to liberate Kashmir as an anti-Indian war. Khan also accused India of raising its defence budget in the past two years, a charge which Nehru rejected while expressing surprise at Khan's dismissal of the virulent anti-Indian propaganda. Khan and Nehru also disagreed on the details of the no-war declarations. Khan then submitted a peace plan calling for a withdrawal of troops, settlement in Kashmir by plebiscite, renouncing the use of force, end to war propaganda and the signing of a no-war pact. Nehru did not accept the second and third components of this peace plan. The peace plan failed. While an opposition leader in Pakistan did call for war, leaders in both India and Pakistan did urge calm to avert disaster. The Commonwealth had taken up the Kashmir issue in January 1951. Australian Prime Minister Robert Menzies suggested that a Commonwealth force be stationed in Kashmir, that a joint Indo-Pakistani force be stationed in Kashmir and the plebiscite administrator be entitled to raise local troops while the plebiscite would be held. Pakistan accepted these proposals but India rejected them because it did not want Pakistan, who was in India's eyes the aggressor, to have an equal footing. The UN Security Council called on India and Pakistan to honour the resolutions of plebiscite both had accepted in 1948 and 1949. The United States and Britain proposed that if the two could not reach an agreement then arbitration would be considered. Pakistan agreed but Nehru said he would not allow a third person to decide the fate of four million people. Corbell criticized India's stance towards a valid and recommended technique of international cooperation, however, the peace was short-lived. Later by 1953, Sheikh Abdullah, who was by then in favor of resolving Kashmir by a plebiscite, an idea which was anamatha to the Indian government according to historian Zuchi, fell out with the Indian government. He was dismissed and imprisoned in August 1953. His former deputy, Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad was appointed as the prime minister, and Indian security forces were deployed in the valley to control the streets. Nehru's plebiscite offer Soon after the election of Bogra as Prime Minister in Pakistan he met Nehru in London. A second meeting followed in Delhi in the backdrop of unrest in Kashmir following Sheikh Abdullah's arrest. The two sides agreed to hold a plebiscite in Kashmir. Scholar Norani says the agreement Nehru reached with Bogra was only an act to quench the Kashmiri unrest although Raghavan disagrees. They also agreed informally to not retain the UN-appointed plebiscite administrator Nimitz because India felt a pro-Pakistan bias on America's part. An outcry in Pakistan's press against agreeing to India's demand was ignored by both Bogra and Nehru who kept the negotiations on track. The USA in February 1954 announced that it wanted to provide military aid to Pakistan. The USA signed a military pact with Pakistan in May by which Pakistan would receive military equipment and training. The US president tried to alleviate India's concerns by offering similar weaponry to India. This was an unsuccessful attempt. Nehru's misgivings about the US-Pakistan pact made him hostile to a plebiscite. Consequently, when the pact was concluded in May 1954, Nehru withdrew the plebiscite offer and declared that the status quo was the only remaining option. Nehru's withdrawal from the plebiscite option came a major blow to all concerned. 
Scholars have suggested that India was never seriously intent on holding a plebiscite, and the withdrawal came to signify a vindication of their belief. Indian writer Narad C. Chaudhary has observed that Pakistan's acceptance of Western support ensured its survival. He believed that India intended to invade Pakistan twice or thrice during the period 1947 to 1954. For scholar Wayne Wilcox, Pakistan was able to find external support to counter Hindu superiority returning to the group security position of the early 20th century. <inaudible> Sino-Indian War In 1962, troops from the People's Republic of China and India clashed in territory claimed by both. China won a swift victory in the war. Aksai Chin, part of which was under Chinese jurisdiction before the war, remained under Chinese control since then. Another smaller area, the Trans Karakoram, was demarcated as the line of control lock between China and Pakistan, although some of the territory on the Chinese side is claimed by India to be part of Kashmir. The line that separates India from China in this region is known as the line of actual control. <laughs> Operation Gibraltar and 1965 Indo Pakistani War Following its failure to seize Kashmir in 1947, Pakistan supported numerous covert cells in Kashmir using operatives based in its New Delhi embassy. After its military pact with the United States in the 1950s, it intensively studied guerrilla warfare through engagement with the U.S. military. In 1965, it decided that the conditions were ripe for a successful guerrilla war in Kashmir. Code named Operation Gibraltar, companies were dispatched into Indian administered Kashmir, the majority of whose members were Razakars volunteers and Mujahideen recruited from Pakitan administered Kashmir and trained by the army. These irregular forces were supported by officers and men from the paramilitary Northern Light Infantry and Azad Kashmir Rifles as well as commandos from the Special Services Group. About 30,000 infiltrators are estimated to have been dispatched in August 1965 as part of the Operation Gibraltar. The plan was for the infiltrators to mingle with the local populace and incite them to rebellion. Meanwhile, guerrilla warfare would commence, destroying bridges, tunnels, and highways, as well as Indian Army installations and airfields, creating conditions for an armed insurrection in Kashmir. If the attempt failed, Pakistan hoped to have raised international attention to the Kashmir issue. Using the newly acquired sophisticated weapons through the American arms aid, Pakistan believed that it could achieve tactical victories in a quick limited war, however, the Operation Gibraltar ended in failure as the Kashmiris did not revolt. Instead, they turned in infiltrators to the Indian authorities in substantial numbers, and the Indian army ended up fighting the Pakistani army regulars. Pakistan claimed that the captured men were Kashmiri freedom fighters, a claim contradicted by the international media. On 1 September, Pakistan launched an attack across the ceasefire line, targeting Akhnoor in an effort to cut Indian communications into Kashmir. In response, India broadened the war by launching an attack on Pakistani Punjab across the international border. The war lasted until 23 September, ending in a stalemate. Following the Tashkent Agreement, both the sides withdrew to their pre-conflict positions, and agreed not to interfere in each other's internal affairs. Topic: 1971 Indo-Pakistani War and Simla Agreement. The Indo-Pakistani War of 1971 led to a loss for Pakistan and a military surrender in East Pakistan. Bangladesh got created as a separate state with India's support, and India emerged as a clear regional power in South Asia. A bilateral summit was held at Simla as a follow-up to the war, where India pushed for peace in South Asia. At stake were 5,139 square miles of Pakistan's territory captured by India during the conflict, and over 90,000 prisoners of war held in Bangladesh. India was ready to return them in exchange for a durable solution to the Kashmir issue. Diplomat J. N. Dixit states that the negotiations at Simla were painful and tortuous, and almost broke down. 
The deadlock was broken in a personal meeting between the Prime Ministers Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and Indira Gandhi, where Bhutto acknowledged that the Kashmir issue should be finally resolved and removed as a hurdle in India-Pakistan relations, that the ceasefire line, to be renamed the line of control, could be gradually converted into a de jure border between India and Pakistan, and that he would take steps to integrate the Pakistani-controlled portions of Jammu and Kashmir into the federal territories of Pakistan. However, he requested that the formal declaration of the agreement should not include a final settlement of the Kashmir dispute as it would endanger his fledgling civilian government and bring in military and other hardline elements into power in Pakistan. Accordingly, the Simla agreement was formulated and signed by the two countries, whereby the countries resolved to settle their differences by peaceful means through bilateral negotiations and to maintain the sanctity of the line of control. Multilateral negotiations were not ruled out, but they were conditional upon both sides agreeing to them. To India, this meant an end to the UN or other multilateral negotiations. However Pakistan reinterpreted the wording in the light of a reference to the UN Charter in the agreement, and maintained that it could still approach the UN. The United States, United Kingdom and most Western governments agree with India's interpretation. The Simla agreement also stated that the two sides would meet again for establishing durable peace. Reportedly Bhutto asked for time to prepare the people of Pakistan and the National Assembly for a final settlement. Indian commentators state that he reneged on the promise. Bhutto told the National Assembly on 14 July that he forged an equal agreement from an unequal beginning and that he did not compromise on the right of self-determination for Jammu and Kashmir. The envisioned meeting never occurred. <laughs> Internal conflict Political movements during the Dagra rule Political movements in the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir started in 1932, earlier than in any other princely state of India. In that year, Sheikh Abdullah, a Kashmiri, and Chaudhry Ghulam Abbas, a Jamuti, led the founding of the All Jammu and Kashmir Muslim Conference in order to agitate for the rights of Muslims in the state. In 1938, they renamed the Party National Conference in order to make it representative of all Kashmiris independent of religion. The move brought Abdullah closer to Jawaharlal Nehru, the rising leader of the Congress Party. The National Conference eventually became a leading member of the All India States People's Conference, a Congress-sponsored confederation of the political movements in the princely states. Three years later, rifts developed within the conference owing to political, regional and ideological differences. A faction of the party's leadership grew disenchanted with Abdullah's leanings towards Nehru and the Congress, and his secularization of Kashmiri politics. Consequently, Abbas broke away from the National Conference and revived the Old Muslim Conference in 1941, in collaboration with Mirwais Yusuf Shah. These developments indicated fissures between the ethnic Kashmiris and Jamuts, as well as between the Hindus and Muslims of Jammu. Muslims in the Jammu region were Punjabi-speaking and felt closer affinity to Punjabi Muslims than with the Valley Kashmiris. In due course, the Muslim Conference started aligning itself ideologically with the All India Muslim League, and supported its call for an independent Pakistan. The Muslim Conference derived popular support among the Muslims of the Jammu region, and some from the Valley. Conversely, Abdullah's National Conference enjoyed influence in the Valley. Chitraleka Zuchi states that the political loyalties of Valley Kashmiris were divided in 1947, but the Muslim Conference failed to capitalize on it due to its fractiousness and the lack of a distinct political program. In 1946, the National Conference launched the Quit Kashmir movement, asking the Maharaja to hand the power over to the people. The movement came under criticism from the Muslim Conference, who charged that Abdullah was doing it to boost his own popularity, waning because of his pro India stance. Instead, the Muslim Conference launched a campaign of action similar to Muslim League's program in British India. Both Abdullah and Abbas were imprisoned. By the 22nd of July 1947, the Muslim Conference started calling for the state's accession to Pakistan. The Dagra Hindus of Jammu were originally organized under the banner of All Jammu and Kashmir Raja Hindu Sabha, with Prem Nath Dagra as a leading member. In 1942, Balraj Madhok arrived in the state as a prakarik of the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh RSS. He established branches of the RSS in Jammu and later in the Kashmir Valley. 
Prem Nath Dagra was also the chairman of the RSS in Jammu. In May 1947, following the partition plan, the Hindu Sabha threw in its support to whatever the Maharaja might decide regarding the state's status, which in effect meant support for the state's independence. However, following the communal upheaval of the partition and the tribal invasion, its position changed to supporting the accession of the state to India and, subsequently, full integration of Jammu with India. In November 1947, shortly after the state's accession to India, the Hindu leaders launched the Jammu Praja Parishad with the objective of achieving the full integration of Jammu and Kashmir with India, opposing the communist dominated anti Dagra government of Sheikh Abdullah. Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir Topic Autonomy and Plebiscite Conundrum 1947 Article 370 was drafted in the Indian constitution granting special autonomous status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, as per instrument of accession. This article specifies that the state must concur in the application of laws by Indian Parliament, except those that pertain to communications, defence and foreign affairs. Central government could not exercise its power to interfere in any other areas of governance of the state. Sheikh Abdullah took oath as Prime Minister of the state on 17 March 1948. In 1949, the Indian government obliged Hari Singh to leave Jammu and Kashmir and yield the government to Sheikh Abdullah. Karen Singh, the son of the erstwhile Maharaja Hari Singh was made the Sadr i Riyasat constitutional head of state and the governor of the state. Elections were held for the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir in 1951, with 75 seats allocated for the Indian administered part of Kashmir, and 25 seats left reserved for the Pakistan administered part. Sheikh Abdullah's National Conference won all 75 seats in a rigged election. In October 1951, Jammu and Kashmir National Conference under the leadership of Sheikh Abdullah formed the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir to formulate the constitution of the state. Sheikh initially wanted the Constituent Assembly to decide the state's accession. But this was not agreed to by Nehru, who stated that such underhand dealing would be very bad, as the matter was being decided by the UN. Sheikh Abdullah was said to have ruled the state in an undemocratic and authoritarian manner during this period. According to historian Zuchi, in the late 1940s, most Kashmiri Muslims in Indian Kashmir were still debating the value of the state's association with India or Pakistan. By the 1950s, she says, the National Conference government's repressive measures and the Indian state's seeming determination to settle the state's accession to India without a reference to the people of the state brought Kashmiri Muslims to extol the virtues of Pakistan and condemn India's high-handedness in its occupation of the territory, and even those who had been in India's favour began to speak in terms of the state's association with Pakistan. In early 1949, an agitation was started by Jammu Praja Parishad, a Hindu nationalist party which which was active in the Jammu region, over the ruling National Conference's policies. The government swiftly suppressed it by arresting as many as 294 members of the Praja Parishad including Prem Nath Dagra, its president. Though Sheikh's land reforms were said to have benefited the people of rural areas, Praja Parishad opposed the Landed Estates Abolition Act, saying it was against the Indian constitutional rights, for implementing land acquisition without compensation. Praja Parishad also called for the full integration with the rest of India, directly clashing with the demands of National Conference for complete autonomy of the state. On 15 January 1952, students staged a demonstration against the hoisting of the state flag alongside the Indian Union flag. They were penalised, giving rise to a big procession on 8 February. The military was called out and a 72-hour curfew imposed. N. Gopalaswamy Ayangar, the Indian Central Cabinet Minister in charge of Kashmir affairs, came down to broker peace, which was resented by Sheikh Abdullah. In order to break the constitutional deadlock, Nehru invited the National Conference to send a delegation to Delhi. The 1952 Delhi Agreement was formulated to settle the extent of applicability of the Indian constitution to the Jammu and Kashmir and the relation between the state and centre. It was reached between Nehru and Abdullah on 24 July 1952. Following this, the Constituent Assembly abolished the monarchy in Kashmir, and adopted an elected head of state Sadr -i 
However, the Assembly was reluctant to implement the remaining measures agreed to in the Delhi Agreement. In 1952, Sheikh Abdullah drifted from his previous position of endorsing accession to India to insisting on the self determination of Kashmiris. The Praja Parishad undertook a civil disobedience campaign for a third time in November 1952, which again led to repression by the state government. The Parishad accused Abdullah of communalism sectarianism, favoring the Muslim interests in the state and sacrificing the interests of the others. The Jana Sangh joined hands with the Hindu Mahasabha and Ram Raja Parishad to launch a parallel agitation in Delhi. In May 1953, Shyama Prasad Mukherjee, a prominent Indian leader of the time and the founder of Hindu nationalist party Bharatiya Jana Sangh later evolved as BJP, made a bid to enter Jammu and Kashmir after denying to take a permit, citing his rights as an Indian citizen to visit any part of the country. Abdullah prohibited his entry and promptly arrested him when he attempted. An estimated 10,000 activists were imprisoned in Jammu, Punjab and Delhi, including members of parliament. Unfortunately, Mukherjee died in detention on 23 June 1953, leading to an uproar in whole India and precipitating a crisis that went out of control. Observers state that Abdullah became upset, as he felt, his absolute power was being compromised in India. Meanwhile, Nehru's pledge of a referendum to people of Kashmir did not come into action. Sheikh Abdullah advocated complete independence and had allegedly joined hands with U.S. to conspire against India. On 8 August 1953, Sheikh Abdullah was dismissed as Prime Minister by the Sadr i Riyasat Karan Singh on the charge that he had lost the confidence of his cabinet. He was denied the opportunity to prove his majority on the floor of the House. He was also jailed in 1953 while Sheikh's dissident deputy, Bakshi Ghulam Muhammad, was appointed as the new Prime Minister of the state. Period of integration and rise of Kashmiri nationalism 1954 -1974. From all the information I have, 95% of Kashmir Muslims do not wish to be or remain Indian citizens. I doubt therefore the wisdom of trying to keep people by force where they do not wish to stay. This cannot but have serious long-term political consequences, though immediately it may suit policy and please public opinion. Bakshi Muhammad implemented all the measures of the 1952 Delhi Agreement. In May 1954, as a subsequent to the Delhi Agreement, the Constitution Application to Jammu and Kashmir Order, 1954, is issued by the President of India under Article 370, with the concurrence of the Government of the State of Jammu and Kashmir. In that order, the Article 35A is added to the Constitution of India to empower the Jammu and Kashmir state's legislature to define permanent residents of the state and provide special rights and privileges to those permanent residents. On the 15th of February 1954, under the leadership of Bakshi Muhammad, the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir ratified the state's accession to India. On 17 November 1956, the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir was adopted by the Assembly and it came into full effect on 26 January 1957. On 24 January 1957, the UN passed a resolution stating that the decisions of the Constituent Assembly would not constitute a final disposition of the state, which needs to be carried out by a free and impartial plebiscite. After the overthrow of Sheikh Abdullah, his lieutenant Mirza Afzal Beg formed the Plebiscite Front on 9 August 1955 to fight for the plebiscite demand and the unconditional release of Sheikh Abdullah. The activities of the plebiscite front eventually led to the institution of the infamous Kashmir conspiracy case in 1958 and two other cases. On 8 August 1958, Abdullah was arrested on the charges of these cases. India's Home Minister, Pandit Govind Balab Pant, during his visit to Srinagar in 1956, declared that the state of Jammu and Kashmir was an integral part of India and there could be no question of a plebiscite to determine its status afresh, hinting that India would resist plebiscite efforts from then on. After the mass unrest due to missing of holy relic from the Hazratbal shrine on 27 December 1963, the state government dropped all charges in the Kashmir conspiracy case as a diplomatic decision, on 8 April 1964. Sheikh Abdullah was released and returned to Srinagar where he was accorded a great welcome by the people of the valley. After his release he was reconciled with Nehru. Nehru requested Sheikh Abdullah to act as a bridge between India and Pakistan and make President Ayub to agree to come to New Delhi for the talks for a final solution of the Kashmir problem. 
President Ayub Khan also sent telegrams to Nehru and Sheikh Abdullah with the message that as Pakistan too was a party to the Kashmir dispute any resolution of the conflict without its participation would not be acceptable to Pakistan. Sheikh Abdullah went to Pakistan in the spring of 1964. President Ayub Khan of Pakistan held extensive talks with him to explore various avenues for solving the Kashmir problem and agreed to come to Delhi in mid-June for talks with Nehru as suggested by him. Even the date of his proposed visit was fixed and communicated to New Delhi. However, while Abdullah was still in Pakistan, news came of the sudden death of Nehru on 27 May 1964. The peace initiative died with Nehru. After Nehru's death in 1964, Abdullah was interned from 1965 to 1968 and exiled from Kashmir in 1971 for 18 months. The plebiscite front was also banned. This was allegedly done to prevent him and the plebiscite front which was supported by him from taking part in elections in Kashmir on the 21st of November 1964 the articles 356 and 357 of the Indian constitution were extended to the state by virtue of which the central government can assume the government of the state and exercise its legislative powers on the 24th of November 1964, the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly passed a constitutional amendment changing the elected post of Sadr i Riasat to a centrally nominated post of Governor and renaming Prime Minister to Chief Minister, which is regarded as the end of the road for the Article 370 and the constitutional autonomy guaranteed by it. On 3 January 1965, prior to 1967 assembly elections, the Jammu and Kashmir National Conference dissolved itself and merged into the Indian National Congress, as a marked centralizing strategy. After Indo Pakistani War of 1965, Kashmiri nationalists Amanullah Khan and Makbul Bhatt, along with Hashim Qureshi, in 1966, formed another plebiscite front in Azad Kashmir with an armed wing called the National Liberation Front, NLF, with the objective of freeing. Kashmir from Indian occupation and then liberating the whole of Jammu and Kashmir. Later in 1976, Makbul Bhatt is arrested on his return to the valley. Amanullah Khan moved to England and their NLF was renamed Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front Shortly after 1965 war, Kashmiri Pandit activist and writer, Prem Nath Bazaz wrote that the overwhelming majority of Kashmir's Muslims were unfriendly to India and wanted to get rid of the political setup, but did not want to use violence for this purpose. He added, It would take another quarter century of repression and generation turnover for the pacifist approach to yield decisively as armed struggle, qualifying Kashmiris as reluctant secessionists. In 1966 the Indian opposition leader Jayaprakash wrote to Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that India rules Kashmir by force. <inaudible> Revival of National Conference 1975 In 1971, the Declaration of Bangladesh's Independence was proclaimed on 26 March by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and subsequently the Bangladesh Liberation War broke out in erstwhile East Pakistan between Pakistan and Bangladesh which was later joined by India, and subsequently war broke out on the western border of India between India and Pakistan, both of which culminated in the creation of Bangladesh. It is said that, Sheikh Abdullah, watching the alarming turn of events in the subcontinent, realized that for the survival of the region, there was an urgent need to stop pursuing confrontational politics and promoting solution of issues by a process of reconciliation and dialogue. Critics of Sheikh hold the view that he gave up the cherished goal of plebiscite for gaining chief minister's chair. He started talks with the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi for normalizing the situation in the region and came to an accord with her, called 1975 Indira Sheikh Accord, by giving up the demand for a plebiscite in lieu of the people being given the right to self-rule by a democratically elected government as envisaged under Article 370 of the Constitution of India, rather than the puppet government, which is said to have ruled the state until then. Sheikh Abdullah revived the National Conference, and Mirza Afzal Beg's plebiscite front was dissolved in the NC. Sheikh assumed the position of Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir again after 11 years. Later in 1977, the central government and the ruling Congress party withdrew its support so that the state assembly had to be dissolved and mid-term elections called. 
Sheikh's Party National Conference won a majority, 47 out of 74 seats, in the subsequent elections, on the pledge to restore Jammu and Kashmir's autonomy, and Sheikh Abdullah was re elected as Chief Minister. The 1977 Assembly election is regarded as the first free and fair election in the Jammu and Kashmir state. He remained as Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir until his death in 1982. Later his eldest son Farooq Abdullah succeeded him as the chief minister of the state. During the 1983 assembly elections, Indira Gandhi campaigned aggressively, raising the bogey of a Muslim invasion in the Jammu region because of the resettlement bill, passed by the then NC government, which gave Kashmiris who left for Pakistan between 1947 and 1954 the right to return, reclaim their properties and resettle. On the other hand, Farooq Abdullah allied with the Mirwais Malvi Muhammad Farooq for the elections and charged that the state's autonomy had been eroded by successive Congress party governments. The strategies yielded dividends and the Congress won 26 seats, while the NC secured 46. Barring an odd constituency, all victories of the Congress were in the Jammu and Ladakh regions, while NC swept the Kashmir Valley. This election is said to have cemented the political polarization on religious lines in the Jammu and Kashmir state. After the results of the 1983 election, the Hindu nationalists in the state were demanding stricter central government control over the state, whereas Kashmir's Muslims wanted to preserve the state's autonomy. Islamic fundamentalist groups clamored for a plebiscite. Malvi Farooq challenged the contention that there was no longer a dispute on Kashmir. He said that the people's movement for plebiscite would not die even though India thought it did when Sheikh Abdullah died. In 1983, learned men of Kashmiri politics testified that Kashmiris had always wanted to be independent. But the more serious minded among them also realized that this is not possible, considering Kashmir's size and borders. According to Professor Marita Rai, for three decades Delhi's hand picked politicians in Kashmir had supported the state's accession to India in return for generous disbursements from Delhi. Rai states that the state elections were conducted in Jammu and Kashmir, but except for the 1977 and 1983 elections, no state election was fair. Kashmiri Pandit activist Prem Nath Bazaz wrote that if free elections were held, the majority of seats would be won by those not friendly to India. Topic: <laughs> Rise of the separatist movement and Islamism, 1984 to 1986. Increasing anti-Indian protests took place in Kashmir in the 1980s. The Soviet Afghan Jihad and the Islamic Revolution in Iran were becoming sources of inspiration for large numbers of Kashmiri Muslim youth. The state authorities responded with increasing use of brute force to simple economic demands. Both the pro-independence Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front JKLF and the pro-Pakistan Islamist groups including JIJK mobilized the fast-growing anti-Indian sentiments among the Kashmiri population. 1984 saw a pronounced rise in terrorist violence in Kashmir. When Kashmir Liberation Front militant Makbul Bhatt was executed in February 1984, strikes and protests by Kashmiri nationalists broke out in the region. Large numbers of Kashmiri youth participated in widespread anti-India demonstrations, which faced heavy-handed reprisals by Indian state forces. Critics of the then Chief Minister, Farooq Abdullah, charged that Abdullah was losing control. His visit to Pakistan administered Kashmir became an embarrassment, where according to Hashim Qureshi, he shared a platform with Kashmir Liberation Front. Though Abdullah asserted that he went on behalf of Indira Gandhi and his father, so that sentiments there could be known firsthand. Few people believed him. There were also allegations that he had allowed Khalistan terrorist groups to train in Jammu province, although those allegations were never proved. On July 2, 1984, Ghulam Muhammad Shah, who had support from Indira Gandhi, replaced his brother in law Farooq Abdullah and became the chief minister of Jammu and Kashmir, after Abdullah was dismissed, in what was termed as a political coup. In 1986 some members of the JKLF crossed over to Pakistan to receive arms training but the Jamaat Islami Jammu Kashmir, which saw Kashmiri nationalism as contradicting Islamic universalism and its own desire for merging with Pakistan, did not support the JKLF movement. As late as that year, Jamaat member Syed Ali Shah Jalani, who later became a supporter of Kashmir's armed revolt, urged that the solution for the Kashmir issue be arrived at through peaceful and democratic means. 
To achieve its goal of self-determination for the people of Jammu and Kashmir the Jamaat-e-Islami's stated position was that the Kashmir issues be resolved through constitutional means and dialogue. Shah's administration, which did not have the people's mandate, turned to Islamists and opponents of India, notably the Molvi Iftikhar Hussain Ansari, Muhammad Shafi Qureshi and Mohinuddin Salati, to gain some legitimacy through religious sentiments. This gave political space to Islamists who previously lost overwhelmingly, allegedly due to massive rigging, in the 1983 state elections. In 1986, Shah decided to construct a mosque within the premises of an ancient Hindu temple inside the new civil secretariat area in Jammu to be made available to the Muslim employees for namaz. People of Jammu took to streets to protest against this decision, which led to a Hindu-Muslim clash. On his return to Kashmir Valley in February 1986, Gul Shah retaliated and incited the Kashmiri Muslims by saying Islam Khatri Mine Hay trans. Islam is in danger. As a result, communal violence gripped the region, in which Hindus were targeted, especially the Kashmiri Pandits, who later in the year 1990, fled the valley in large numbers. During the Anantnag riot in February 1986, although no Hindu was killed, many houses and other properties belonging to Hindus were looted, burnt or damaged. An investigation of Anantnag riots revealed that members of the secular parties in the state, rather than the Islamists, had played a key role in organizing the violence to gain political mileage through religious sentiments. Shah called in the army to curb the violence, but it had little effect. His government was dismissed on March 12, 1986, by the then Governor Jagmohan following communal riots in South Kashmir. This led Jagmohan to rule the state directly. Jagmohan is said to have failed to distinguish between the secular forms and Islamist expressions of Kashmiri identity, and hence saw that identity as a threat. This failure was exploited by the Islamists of the valley, who defied the Hindu nationalist policies implemented during Jagmohan's tenure, and thereby gained momentum. The political fight was hence being portrayed as a conflict between Hindu New Delhi central government, and its efforts to impose its will in the state, and Muslim Kashmir, represented by political Islamists and clerics. Jagmohan's pro-Hindu bias in the administration led to an increase in the appeal of the Muslim United Front. Post-1987 insurgency in Indian-administered Kashmir <laughs> 1987 state elections An alliance of Islamic parties organized into Muslim United Front to contest the 1987 state elections. Culturally, the growing emphasis on secularism led to a backlash with Islamic parties becoming more popular. MUF's election manifesto stressed the need to solve all outstanding issues according to the Simla Agreement, work for Islamic unity and against political interference from the center. Their slogan was wanting the law of the Quran in the assembly, there was highest recorded participation in this election. 80% of the people in the valley voted. MUF received victory in only four of the contested 43 electoral constituencies despite its high vote share of 31%. This means that its official vote in the valley was larger than one third. The elections were widespreadly believed to have been rigged by the ruling party National Conference, allied with the Indian National Congress. In the absence of rigging, commentators believe that the MUF could have won 15 to 20 seats, a contention admitted by the National Conference leader Farooq Abdullah. Scholar Sumantra Bose, on the other hand, opines that the MUF would have won most of the constituencies in the Kashmir Valley. BBC reported that Kem Lata Waklu, who was a leader of the Congress party at the time, admitted the widespread rigging in Kashmir. He stated, I remember that there was a massive rigging in 1987 elections. The losing candidates were declared winners. It shook the ordinary people's faith in the elections and the democratic process. Topic: 1989 Popular Insurgency and Militancy. In the years since 1990, the Kashmiri Muslims and the Indian government have conspired to abolish the complexities of Kashmiri civilization. 
The world it inhabited has vanished, the state government and the political class, the rule of law, almost all the Hindu inhabitants of the valley, alcohol, cinemas, cricket matches, picnics by moonlight in the saffron fields, schools, universities, an independent press, tourists and banks. In this reduction of civilian reality, the sites of Kashmir are redefined, not the lakes and Mughal gardens, or the storied triumphs of Kashmiri agriculture, handicrafts and cookery, but two entities that confront each other without intermediary, the mosque and the army camp. In 1989, a widespread popular and armed insurgency started in Kashmir. After the 1987 state legislative assembly election, some of the results were disputed. This resulted in the formation of militant wings and marked the beginning of the Mujahideen insurgency, which continues to this day. India contends that the insurgency was largely started by Afghan Mujahideen who entered the Kashmir Valley following the end of the Soviet-Afghan War. Yasin Malik, a leader of one faction of the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front, was one of the Kashmiris to organize militancy in Kashmir, along with Ashfaq Majid Wani, Javed Ahmad Mir, and Abdul Hamid Sheikh. Since 1995, Malik has renounced the use of violence and calls for strictly peaceful methods to resolve the dispute. Malik developed differences with one of the senior leaders, Farooq Siddiqui alias Farooq Papa, for shunning demands for an independent Kashmir and trying to cut a deal with the Indian Prime Minister. This resulted in a split in which Bidda Karate, Salim Nanaji, and other senior comrades joined Farooq Papa. Pakistan claims these insurgents are Jammu and Kashmir citizens, and are rising up against the Indian Army as part of an independence movement. Amnesty International has accused security forces in Indian-controlled Kashmir of exploiting an Armed Forces Special Powers Act that enables them to hold prisoners without trial. The group argues that the law, which allows security forces to detain individuals for up to two years without presenting charges violates prisoners' human rights. In 2011, the State Human Rights Commission said it had evidence that 2,156 bodies had been buried in 40 graves over the last 20 years. The authorities deny such accusations. The security forces say the unidentified dead are militants who may have originally come from outside India. They also say that many of the missing people have crossed into Pakistan administered Kashmir to engage in militancy. However, according to the State Human Rights Commission, among the identified bodies 574 were those of disappeared locals. And according to Amnesty International's annual Human Rights Report 2012, it was sufficient for belying the security forces claim that they were militants. India claims these insurgents are Islamic terrorist groups from Pakistan administered Kashmir and Afghanistan, fighting to make Jammu and Kashmir a part of Pakistan. They claim Pakistan supplies munitions to the terrorists and trains them in Pakistan. India states that the terrorists have killed many citizens in Kashmir and committed human rights violations whilst denying that their own armed forces are responsible for human rights abuses. On a visit to Pakistan in 2006, former Chief Minister of Kashmir Omar Abdullah remarked that foreign militants were engaged in reckless killings and mayhem in the name of religion. The Indian government has said militancy is now on the decline. The Pakistani government calls these insurgents Kashmiri freedom fighters and claims that it provides them only moral and diplomatic support, although India believes they are Pakistan-supported terrorists from Pakistan-administered Kashmir. In October 2008, President Asif Ali Zardari of Pakistan called the Kashmir separatists terrorists in an interview with the Wall Street Journal. These comments sparked outrage amongst many Kashmiris, some of whom defied a curfew imposed by the Indian Army to burn him in effigy. In 2008, pro separatist leader Mirwais Umar Farooq told the Washington Post that there has been a purely indigenous, purely Kashmiri peaceful protest movement alongside the insurgency in Indian administered Kashmir since 1989. The movement was created for the same reason as the insurgency and began after the disputed election of 1987. According to the United Nations, the Kashmiris have grievances with the Indian government, specifically the Indian military, which has committed human rights violations. In 1994, the NGO International Commission of Jurists sent a fact finding mission to Kashmir. The ICJ mission concluded that the right of self determination to which the peoples of Jammu and Kashmir became entitled as part of the process of partition had neither been exercised nor abandoned, and thus remained exercisable. It further stated that as the people of Kashmir had a right of self-determination, it followed that their insurgency was legitimate. 
It, however, did not follow that Pakistan had a right to provide support for the militants. Topic: 1999 conflict in Kargil. In mid-1999, alleged insurgents and Pakistani soldiers from Pakistani Kashmir infiltrated Jammu and Kashmir. During the winter season, Indian forces regularly move down to lower altitudes, as severe climatic conditions makes it almost impossible for them to guard the high peaks near the line of control. This practice is followed by both India and Pakistan army. The terrain makes it difficult for both sides to maintain a strict border control over line of control. The insurgents took advantage of this and occupied vacant mountain peaks in the Kargil range overlooking the highway in Indian Kashmir that connects Srinagar and Leh. By blocking the highway, they could cut off the only link between the Kashmir Valley and Ladakh. This resulted in a large-scale conflict between the Indian and Pakistani armies. The final stage involved major battles by Indian and Pakistani forces resulting in India recapturing most of the territories held by Pakistani forces. Fears of the Kargil War turning into a nuclear war provoked the then United States President Bill Clinton to pressure Pakistan to retreat. The Pakistan Army withdrew their remaining troops from the area, ending the conflict. India regained control of the Kargil peaks, which they now patrol and monitor all year long. Topic: 2000s Al-Qaeda involvement. In a letter to American people written by Osama bin Laden in 2002, he stated that one of the reasons he was fighting America was because of its support for India on the Kashmir issue. While on a trip to Delhi in 2002, U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld suggested that al-Qaeda was active in Kashmir, though he did not have any hard evidence. An investigation by a Christian Science Monitor reporter in 2002 claimed to have unearthed evidence that al-Qaeda and its affiliates were prospering in Pakistan-administered Kashmir with tacit approval of Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence Agency In 2002, a team comprising Special Air Service and Delta Force personnel was sent into Indian-administered Kashmir to hunt for Osama bin Laden after reports that he was being sheltered by the Kashmiri militant group Harkat ul Mujahideen. U.S. officials believed that al-Qaeda was helping organize a campaign of terror in Kashmir to provoke conflict between India and Pakistan. Their strategy was to force Pakistan to move its troops to the border with India, thereby relieving pressure on al-Qaeda elements hiding in northwestern Pakistan. U.S. intelligence analysts say al-Qaeda and Taliban operatives in Pakistan administered Kashmir are helping terrorists trained in Afghanistan to infiltrate Indian administered Kashmir. Fazlur Rahman Khalil, the leader of the Harkat ul Mujahideen, signed al Qaeda's 1998 declaration of holy war, which called on Muslims to attack all Americans and their allies. In 2006, al Qaeda claimed they have established a wing in Kashmir, which worried the Indian government. Indian Army Lieutenant General H. S. Panig, GOC in C. Northern Command, told reporters that the Army has ruled out the presence of al Qaeda in Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir. He said that there no evidence to verify media reports of an al-Qaeda presence in the state. He ruled out al-Qaeda ties with the militant groups in Kashmir including Lashkar-e-Taiba and Jaish-e-Muhammad. However, he stated that they had information about al-Qaeda's strong ties with Lashkar-e-Taiba and Jaish-e-Muhammad operations in Pakistan. While on a visit to Pakistan in January 2010, U.S. Defense Secretary Robert Gates stated that al-Qaeda was seeking to destabilize the region and planning to provoke a nuclear war between India and Pakistan. In June 2011, a U.S. drone strike killed Ilyas Kashmiri, chief of Harkat ul Jihad al Islami, a Kashmiri militant group associated with al-Qaeda. Kashmiri was described by Bruce Riedel as a prominent al-Qaeda member, while others described him as the head of military operations for al-Qaeda. Waziristan had by then become the new battlefield for Kashmiri militants fighting NATO in support of al-Qaeda. Ilyas Kashmiri was charged by the U.S. in a plot against Jylands Posten, the Danish newspaper at the center of the Jylands Posten Muhammad cartoons controversy. In April 2012, Farman Ali Shinwari a former member of Kashmiri separatist groups Harkat ul Mujahideen and Harkat ul Jihad al-Islami, was appointed chief of al-Qaeda in Pakistan. <laughs> Reasons behind the dispute 
The Kashmir conflict arose from the partition of British India in 1947 into modern India and Pakistan. Both countries subsequently made claims to Kashmir, based on the history and religious affiliations of the Kashmiri people. The princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which lies strategically in the northwest of the subcontinent bordering Afghanistan and China, was formerly ruled by Maharaja Hari Singh under the paramountcy of British India. In geographical and legal terms, the Maharaja could have joined either of the two new countries. Although urged by the Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten of Burma, to determine the future of his state before the transfer of power took place, Singh demurred. In October 1947, incursions by Pakistan took place leading to a war, as a result of which the state of Jammu and Kashmir remains divided between India and Pakistan. Two-thirds of the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, comprising Jammu, the Kashmir Valley, and the sparsely populated Buddhist area of Ladakh are controlled by India while one-third is administered by Pakistan. The latter includes a narrow strip of land called Azad Kashmir and the northern areas, comprising the Gilgit Agency, Baltistan, and the former kingdoms of Hunza and Nagar. Attempts to resolve the dispute through political discussions have been unsuccessful. In September 1965, war again broke out between Pakistan and India. The United Nations called for another ceasefire, and peace was restored following the Tashkent Declaration in 1966, by which both nations returned to their original positions along the demarcated line. After the 1971 war and the creation of independent Bangladesh under the terms of the 1972 Simla Agreement between Prime Minister Indira Gandhi of India and Dufakar Ali Bhutto of Pakistan, it was agreed that neither country would seek to alter the ceasefire line in Kashmir, which was renamed as the Line of Control, unilaterally, irrespective of mutual differences and legal interpretations. Numerous violations of the line of control have occurred, including incursions by insurgents and Pakistani armed forces at Kargil leading to the Kargil War. There have also been sporadic clashes on the Siachen Glacier, where the line of control is not demarcated and both countries maintain forces at altitudes rising to 20,000 feet 6, meters, with the Indian forces serving at higher altitudes. Indian view India has officially stated that it believes that Kashmir to be an integral part of India, though the then Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, stated after the 2010 Kashmir unrest that his government was willing to grant autonomy to the region within the purview of Indian constitution if there was consensus among political parties on this issue. The Indian viewpoint is succinctly summarized by Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, India holds that the instrument of accession of the state of Jammu and Kashmir to the Union of India, signed by Maharaja Hari Singh erstwhile ruler of the state on 25 October 1947 and executed on 27 October 1947 between the ruler of Kashmir and the Governor-General of India was a legal act and completely valid in terms of the Government of India Act 1935, Indian Independence Act 1947, as well as under international law and as such was total and irrevocable. The Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir had unanimously ratified the Maharaja's instrument of accession to India and adopted a constitution for the state that called for a perpetual merger of Jammu and Kashmir with the Union of India. India claims that the Constituent Assembly was a representative one, and that its views were those of the Kashmiri people at the time. United Nations Security Council Resolution 1172 tacitly accepts India's stand regarding all outstanding issues between India and Pakistan and urges the need to resolve the dispute through mutual dialogue without the need for a plebiscite in the framework of UN Charter. United Nations Security Council Resolution 47 cannot be implemented since Pakistan failed to withdraw its forces from Kashmir, which was the first step in implementing the resolution. India is also of the view that Resolution 47 is obsolete, since the geography and demographics of the region have permanently altered since its adoption. The resolution was passed by United Nations Security Council under Chapter 6 of the United Nations Charter and as such is non-binding with no mandatory enforceability, as opposed to resolutions passed under Chapter 7. India does not accept the two-nation theory that forms the basis of Pakistan's claims and considers that Kashmir, despite being a Muslim-majority state, is in many ways an integral part of secular India. 
The state of Jammu and Kashmir was provided with significant autonomy under Article 370 of the Constitution of India. All differences between India and Pakistan, including Kashmir, need to be settled through bilateral negotiations as agreed to by the two countries under the Simla Agreement signed on 2 July 1972. Additional Indian viewpoints regarding the broader debate over the Kashmir conflict include In a diverse country like India, disaffection and discontent are not uncommon. Indian democracy has the necessary resilience to accommodate genuine grievances within the framework of India's sovereignty, unity, and integrity. The Government of India has expressed its willingness to accommodate the legitimate political demands of the people of the state of Kashmir. Insurgency and terrorism in Kashmir is deliberately fueled by Pakistan to create instability in the region. The Government of India has repeatedly accused Pakistan of waging a proxy war in Kashmir by providing weapons and financial assistance to terrorist groups in the region. Pakistan is trying to raise anti-India sentiment among the people of Kashmir by spreading false propaganda against India. According to the state government of Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistani radio and television channels deliberately spread hate and venom against India to alter Kashmiri opinion. India has asked the United Nations not to leave unchallenged or unaddressed the claims of moral, political, and diplomatic support for terrorism, which were clearly in contravention of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1373. This is a Chapter 7 resolution that makes it mandatory for member states to not provide active or passive support to terrorist organizations. Specifically, it has pointed out that the Pakistani government continues to support various terrorist organizations, such as Jaish e Muhammad and Lashkar e Taiba, in direct violation of this resolution. India points out reports by human rights organizations condemning Pakistan for the lack of civic liberties in Pakistan administered Kashmir. According to India, most regions of Pakistani Kashmir, especially northern areas, continue to suffer from lack of political recognition, economic development, and basic fundamental rights. Karen Singh, the son of the last ruler of the princely state of Kashmir and Jammu, has said that the instrument of accession signed by his father was the same as signed by other states. He opined that Kashmir was therefore a part of India, and that its special status granted by Article 370 of the Indian Constitution stemmed from the fact that it had its own constitution. According to a poll in an Indian newspaper, Indians were keener to keep control of Kashmir than Pakistanis. 67% of urban Indians want New Delhi to be in full control of Kashmir. Michigan State University scholar Baljeet Singh, interviewing Indian foreign policy experts in 1965, found that 77% of them favoured discussions with Pakistan on all outstanding problems including the Kashmir dispute. However, only 17% were supportive of holding a plebiscite in Kashmir. The remaining 60% were pessimistic of a solution due to a distrust of Pakistan or a perception of threats to India's internal institutions. They contended that India's secularism was far from stable and the possibility of Kashmir separating from India or joining Pakistan would endanger Hindu Muslim relations in India. In 2008, the death toll from the last 20 years was estimated by Indian authorities to be over 47,000. In 2017, India's Union Home Minister, Rajnath Singh, demanded that Pakistan desist from demanding a plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir, saying, if at all a referendum is required, it is needed in Pakistan, where people should be asked whether they want to continue in Pakistan or are demanding the country's merger with India. Pakistani view Pakistan maintains that Kashmir is the jugular vein of Pakistan and a currently disputed territory whose final status must be determined by the people of Kashmir. Pakistan's claims to the disputed region are based on the rejection of Indian claims to Kashmir, namely the instrument of accession. Pakistan insists that the Maharaja was not a popular leader, and was regarded as a tyrant by most Kashmiris. Pakistan maintains that the Maharaja used brute force to suppress the population. Pakistan claims that Indian forces were in Kashmir before the instrument of accession was signed with India, and that therefore Indian troops were in Kashmir in violation of the standstill agreement, which was designed to maintain the status quo in Kashmir. Although India was not signatory to the agreement, which was signed between Pakistan and the Hindu ruler of Jammu and Kashmir from 1990 to 1999, some organizations reported that the Indian armed forces 
forces, its paramilitary groups, and counter-insurgent militias were responsible for the deaths of 4,501 Kashmiri civilians. During the same period, there were records of 4,242 women between the ages of 7 to 70 being raped. Similar allegations were also made by some human rights organizations. In short, Pakistan holds that the popular Kashmiri insurgency demonstrates that the Kashmiri people no longer wish to remain within India. Pakistan suggests that this means that Kashmir either wants to be with Pakistan or independent. According to the two nation theory, one of the principles that is cited for the partition that created India and Pakistan, Kashmir should have been with Pakistan, because it has a Muslim majority. India has shown disregard for the resolutions of the UN Security Council and the United Nations Commission in India and Pakistan by failing to hold a plebiscite to determine the future allegiance of the state. The reason for India's disregard of the resolutions of the UN Security Council was given by India's Defence Minister, Kirshnan Menon, who said, Kashmir would vote to join Pakistan and no Indian government responsible for agreeing to plebiscite would survive. Pakistan was of the view that the Maharaja of Kashmir had no right to call in the Indian army, because it held that the Maharaja of Kashmir was not a hereditary ruler and was merely a British appointee, after the British defeated Ranjit Singh who ruled the area before the British conquest. Pakistan has noted the widespread use of extrajudicial killings in Indian-administered Kashmir carried out by Indian security forces while claiming they were caught up in encounters with militants. These encounters are commonplace in Indian-administered Kashmir. The encounters go largely uninvestigated by the authorities, and the perpetrators are spared criminal prosecution. Pakistan disputes claims by India with reference to the Simla agreement that UN resolutions on Kashmir have lost their relevance. It argues that legally and politically, UN resolutions cannot be superseded without the UN Security Council adopting a resolution to that effect. It also maintains the Simla Agreement emphasized exploring a peaceful bilateral outcome, without excluding the role of UN and other negotiations. This is based on its interpretation of Article 1 I, stating, The principles and purposes of the Charter of the United Nations shall govern the relations between the two countries. Human rights organizations have strongly condemned Indian troops for widespread rape and murder of innocent civilians while accusing these civilians of being militants. The Chenab formula was a compromise proposed in the 1960s, in which the Kashmir Valley and other Muslim-dominated areas north of the Chenab River would go to Pakistan, and Jammu and other Hindu-dominated regions would go to India. A poll by an Indian newspaper shows 48% of Pakistanis want Islamabad to take full control of Kashmir, 47% of Pakistanis support Kashmiri independence. Former Pakistani President General Pervez Musharraf on the 16th of October 2014 said that Pakistan needs to incite those fighting in Kashmir. We have source in Kashmir besides the Pakistan army. People in Kashmir are fighting against India. We just need to incite them. Musharraf told a TV channel, in 2015 Pakistan's outgoing national security advisor Sartaj Aziz said that Pakistan wished to have third-party mediation on Kashmir, but it was unlikely to happen unless by international pressure. Under Shimla Accord it was decided that India and Pakistan would resolve their disputes bilaterally, Aziz said. Such bilateral talks have not yielded any results for the last 40 years. So then what is the solution? Topic. Chinese view China states that Aksai Chin is an integral part of China and does not recognize the inclusion of Aksai Chin as part of the Kashmir region. China did not accept the boundaries of the princely state of Kashmir and Jammu, north of Aksai Chin and the Karakoram as proposed by the British. China settled its border disputes with Pakistan under the 1963 Trans-Karakoram Tract with the provision that the settlement was subject to the final solution of the Kashmir dispute. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Kashmiri views. Scholar Andrew Whitehead states that Kashmiris view Kashmir as having been ruled by their own in 1586. Since then, they believe, it has been ruled in succession by the Mughals, Afghans, Sikhs, Dagras and, lately, the Indian government. 
Whitehead states that this is only partly true. The Mughals lavished much affection and resources on Kashmir, the Dagras made Srinagar their capital next only to their native Jammu city, and through much of the post independence India, Kashmiri Muslims headed the state government. Yet Kashmiris bear an acute sense of grievance that they were not in control of their own fate for centuries. A. G. Norani, a constitutional expert, says the people of Kashmir are very much a party to the dispute. According to an opinion poll conducted by Center for the Study of Developing Societies in 2007, 87% of people in mainly Muslim Srinagar want independence, whereas 95% of the people in the mainly Hindu Jammu city think the state should be part of India. The Kashmir Valley is the only region of the former princely state where the majority of the population is unhappy with its current status. The Hindus of Jammu and Buddhists of Ladakh are content under Indian administration. Muslims of Azad Kashmir and northern areas are content under Pakistani administration. Kashmir Valley's Muslims want to change their national status to independence. Scholar A.G. Norani testifies that Kashmiris want a plebiscite to achieve freedom. Zuchi states the people of Poonch and Gilgit may have had a chance to determine their future but the Kashmiri was lost in the process. Since the 1947 accession of Kashmir to India was provisional and conditional on the wishes of the people, the Kashmiris' right to determine their future was recognized. Norani notes that state elections do not satisfy this requirement. Kashmiris assert that except for 1977 and 1983 elections, no state election has been fair. According to scholar Sumantra Bose, India was determined to stop fair elections since that would have meant that elections would be won by those unfriendly to India. The Kashmiri people have still not been able to exercise the right to self-determination and this was the conclusion of the International Commission of Jurists in 1994. Aisha Parvez writes in The Hindu that high voter turnout in Kashmir cannot be interpreted as a sign of acceptance of Indian rule. Voters vote due to varying factors such as development, effective local governance and economy. The Hurriyat parties do not want to participate in elections under the framework of the Indian constitution. Elections held by India are seen as a diversion from the main issue of self-determination. Kashmiri opponents to Indian rule maintain that India has stationed 600,000 Indian troops in what is the highest ratio of troops to civilian density in the world. Kashmiri scholars say that India's military occupation inflicts violence and humiliation on Kashmiris. Indian forces are responsible for human rights abuses and terror against the local population and have killed tens of thousands of civilians. India's state forces have used rape as a cultural weapon of war against Kashmiris and rape has extraordinarily high incidence in Kashmir as compared to other conflict zones of the world. Militants are also guilty of crimes but their crimes cannot be compared with the scale of abuses by Indian forces for which justice is yet to be delivered. Kashmiri scholars say that India's reneging on promise of plebiscite, violations of constitutional provisions of Kashmir's autonomy and subversion of the democratic process led to the rebellion of 1989-1990. According to scholar Marita Rai, the majority of Kashmiri Muslims believe they are scarcely better off under Indian rule than the 101 years of Dagra rule. According to lawyer and human rights activist K. Balagopal, Kashmiris have a distinct sense of identity and this identity is certainly not irreligious, as Islam is very much a part of the identity that Kashmiris feel strongly for. He opined that if only non-religious identities deserve support, then no national self-determination movement can be supported, because there is no national identity, at least in the third world, devoid of the religious dimension. Balagopal says that if India and Pakistan cannot guarantee existence and peaceful development of independent Kashmir then Kashmiris may well choose Pakistan because of religious affinity and social and economic links. But if both can guarantee existence and peaceful development then most Kashmiris would prefer independent Kashmir. <laughs> Cross-border troubles The border and the line of control separating Indian and Pakistani Kashmir passes through some exceptionally difficult terrain. The world's highest battleground, the Siachen Glacier, is a part of this difficult-to-man boundary. Even with 200,000 military personnel, India maintains that it is infeasible to place enough men to guard all sections of the border throughout the various seasons of the year. Pakistan has indirectly acquiesced its role in failing to prevent 
cross-border terrorism when it agreed to curb such activities after intense pressure from the Bush administration in mid-2002. The government of Pakistan has repeatedly claimed that by constructing a fence along the line of control, India is violating the Shimla Accord. India claims the construction of the fence has helped decrease armed infiltration into Indian-administered Kashmir. In 2002, Pakistani President and Army Chief General Pervez Musharraf promised to check infiltration into Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan's relation with militants India has furnished documentary evidence to the United Nations that Pakistan supports Kashmiri militants, leading to a ban on some terrorist organizations, which Pakistan has yet to enforce. Former President of Pakistan and the ex-chief of the Pakistan military Pervez Musharraf, stated in an interview in London, that the Pakistani government indeed helped to form underground militant groups and turned a blind eye towards their existence because they wanted India to discuss Kashmir. According to former Indian Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, one of the main reasons behind the conflict was Pakistan's terror-induced coercion. He further stated at a joint press conference with United States President Barack Obama in New Delhi that India is not afraid of resolving all the issues with Pakistan including that of Kashmir. But it is our request that you cannot simultaneously be talking and at the same time the terror machine is as active as ever before. Once Pakistan moves away from this terror-induced coercion, we will be very happy to engage productively with Pakistan to resolve all outstanding issues." In 2009, the president of Pakistan Asif Zardari asserted at a conference in Islamabad that Pakistan had indeed created Islamic militant groups as a strategic tool for use in its geostrategic agenda and to attack Indian forces in Jammu and Kashmir. Former president of Pakistan and the ex-chief of the Pakistan military Pervez Musharraf also stated in an interview that Pakistani government helped to form underground militant groups to fight against Indian troops in Jammu and Kashmir and turned a blind eye towards their existence because they wanted India to discuss Kashmir. The British government have formally accepted that there is a clear connection between Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence and three major militant outfits operating in Jammu and Kashmir, Lashkar-e-Taiba, Jaish-e-Muhammad and harkat ul mujahideen The militants are provided with weapons, training, advice and planning assistance in Punjab and Kashmir by the ISI which is coordinating the shipment of arms from the Pakistani side of Kashmir to the Indian side, where Muslim insurgents are waging a protracted war." Throughout the 1990s, the ISI maintained its relationship with extremist networks and militants that it had established during the Afghan war to utilize in its campaign against Indian forces in Kashmir. Joint Intelligence, North Jin has been accused of conducting operations in Jammu and Kashmir and also Afghanistan. The Joint Signal Intelligence Bureau JSIB provide communications support to groups in Kashmir. According to Daniel Benjamin and Stephen Simon, both former members of the National Security Council, the ISI acted as a kind of terrorist conveyor belt, radicalizing young men in the madrasas of Pakistan and delivering them to training camps affiliated with or run by Al-Qaeda and from there moving them into Jammu and Kashmir to launch attacks reportedly about 24 million rupees are paid out per month by the ISI to fund its activities in Jammu and Kashmir pro-pakistani groups were reportedly favored over other militant groups creation of six militant groups in Kashmir which included Lashkar-e-Taiba let was aided by the ISI According to American intelligence officials, ISI is still providing protection and help to let. The Pakistan Army and ISI also let volunteers to surreptitiously penetrate from Pakistan administrated Kashmir to Jammu and Kashmir. In the past, Indian authorities have alleged several times that Pakistan has been involved in training and arming underground militant groups to fight Indian forces in Kashmir. Water dispute Another reason for the dispute over Kashmir is water. Kashmir is the source of many rivers and tributaries in the Indus River Basin. This basin is divided between Pakistan, which has about 60% of the catchment area, India with about 20%, Afghanistan with 5% and around 15% in China Tibet Autonomous Region. 
The river tributaries are the Jhelum and Chenab rivers, which primarily flow into Pakistan, while other branches the Ravi, Bees, and the Sutlej irrigate northern India. The Indus is a river system that sustains communities in India and Pakistan. Both have extensively dammed the Indus River for irrigation of their crops and hydroelectricity systems. In arbitrating the conflict in 1947, Sir Cyril Radcliffe, decided to demarcate the territories as he was unable to give to one or the other the control over the river as it was a main economic resource for both areas. The line of control lock was recognized as an international border establishing that India would have control over the upper riparian and Pakistan over the lower riparian of the Indus and its tributaries. Despite appearing to be separate issues, the Kashmir dispute and the dispute over the water control are in reality related and the fight over the water remains one of the main problems in establishing good relations between the two countries. In 1948, Eugene Black, then president of the World Bank, offered his services to solve the tension over water control. In the early days of independence, the fact that India was able to shut off the central Bari Dobe canals at the time of the sowing season, causing significant damage to Pakistan's crops. Nevertheless, military and political clashes over Kashmir in the early years of independence appear to have been more about ideology and sovereignty rather than over the sharing of water resources. However, the Minister of Pakistan has stated the opposite. The Indus Waters Treaty was signed by both countries in September 1960, giving exclusive rights over the three western rivers of the Indus River system Jhelum, Chenab and Indus to Pakistan, and over the three eastern rivers Sutlej, Ravi and Bees to India, as long as this does not reduce or delay the supply to Pakistan. India therefore maintains that they are not willing to break the established regulations and they see no more problems with this issue. Human rights abuses <inaudible> Indian administered Kashmir Human rights abuses such as extrajudicial killings and rapes have been committed by Indian forces in Kashmir. Militants have also committed crimes but their crimes pale in comparison to the crimes of Indian forces. Crimes by state forces are done inside Kashmir Valley which is the location of the present conflict. The 2010 Chatham House opinion poll of the people of Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir found that overall concern, in the entire state, over human rights abuses was 43%. In the surveyed districts of the Muslim-majority Kashmir Valley, where the desire for independence is strongest, there was a high rate of concern over human rights abuses. 88% in Baramulla, 87% in Srinagar, 73% in Anantnag and 55% in Badgam. However, in the Hindu-majority and Buddhist-majority areas of the state, where pro-India sentiment is extremely strong, concern over human rights abuses was low only 3% in Jammu expressed concerns over human rights abuses, according to Hun. Adolphus Towns of the American House of Representatives, around 90,000 Kashmiri Muslims have been killed by the Indian government since 1988. Human Rights Watch says armed militant organizations in Kashmir have also targeted civilians, although not to the same extent as the Indian security forces. Since 1989, over 50,000 people are claimed to have died during the conflict. Data released in 2011 by Jammu and Kashmir government stated that, in the last 21 years, 43,460 people have been killed in the Kashmir insurgency. Of these, 21,323 are militants, 13,226 civilians killed by militants, 3,642 civilians killed by security forces, and 5,369 policemen killed by militants, according to the Jammu and Kashmir government data. Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society says there have been 70,000 plus killings, a majority committed by the Indian Armed Forces. Several international agencies and the UN have reported human rights violations in Indian administered Kashmir. In a 2008 press release the OHCHR spokesman stated, The Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is concerned about the recent violent protests in Indian administered Kashmir that have reportedly led to civilian casualties as well as restrictions to the right to freedom of assembly and expression. A 1996 Human Rights Watch report accuses the Indian military and Indian government-backed paramilitaries of 
commit serious and widespread human rights violations in Kashmir. Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society labels the happenings in Kashmir as war crimes and genocide and have issued a statement that those responsible should be tried in court of law. Some of the massacres by security forces include Gawakadal Massacre, Zakora and Tenjpura Massacre and Handwara Massacre. Another such alleged massacre occurred on 6 January 1993 in the town of Sapor. Time magazine described the incident as such. In retaliation for the killing of one soldier, paramilitary forces rampaged through Sapur's market, setting buildings ablaze and shooting bystanders. The Indian government pronounced the event unfortunate and claimed that an ammunition dump had been hit by gunfire, setting off fires that killed most of the victims. A state government inquiry into the 22nd of October 1993 Baibahara killings, in which the Indian military fired on a procession and killed 40 people and injured 150, found out that the firing by the forces was unprovoked and the claim of the military that it was in retaliation was concocted and baseless. However, the accused are still to be punished. In its report of September 2006, Human Rights Watch stated, Indian security forces claim they are fighting to protect Kashmiris from militants and Islamic extremists, while militants claim they are fighting for Kashmiri independence and to defend Muslim Kashmiris from an abusive Indian army. In reality, both sides have committed widespread and numerous human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law or the laws of war. Many human rights organizations such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch (HRW) have condemned human rights abuses in Kashmir by Indians such as extrajudicial executions, disappearances, and torture. The Armed Forces Special Powers Act Grants the military, wide powers of arrest, the right to shoot to kill, and to occupy or destroy property in counterinsurgency operations. Indian officials claim that troops need such powers because the army is only deployed when national security is at serious risk from armed combatants. Such circumstances, they say, call for extraordinary measures. Human rights organizations have also asked the Indian government to repeal the Public Safety Act, since a detainee may be held in administrative detention for a maximum of two years without a court order." A 2008 report by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees determined that Indian-administered Kashmir was only, partly free. A recent report by Amnesty International stated that up to 20,000 people have been detained under a law called AFSPA in Indian administered Kashmir. Some human rights organizations have alleged that Indian security forces have killed hundreds of Kashmiris through the indiscriminate use of force and torture, firing on demonstrations, custodial killings, encounters, and detentions. The Government of India denied that torture was widespread and stated that some custodial crimes may have taken place but that these are few and far between. According to cables leaked by the WikiLeaks website, U.S. diplomats in 2005 were informed by the International Committee of the Red Cross about the use of torture and sexual humiliation against hundreds of Kashmiri detainees by the security forces. The cable said Indian security forces relied on torture for confessions and that the human right abuses are believed to be condoned by the Indian government. SHRC also accused Indian Army of forced labor. There have been claims of disappearances by the police or the army in Kashmir by several human rights organizations. Human rights groups in Kashmir have documented more than 300 cases of disappearances since 1990, but lawyers believe the number to be far higher because many relatives of disappeared people fear reprisal if they contact a lawyer. In 2016 Jammu and Kashmir Coalition of Civil Society said there are more than 8,000 forced disappearances. State Human Rights Commission SHRC has found 2,730 bodies buried into unmarked graves, scattered in three districts—Bandipura, Baramulla, and Kupwara, of North Kashmir, believed to contain the remains of victims of unlawful killings and enforced disappearances by Indian security forces. SHRC stated that about 574 of these bodies have already been identified as those of disappeared locals. In 2012, the Jammu and Kashmir state government stripped its State Information Commission Department of Most Powers after the commission asked the government to disclose information about the unmarked graves. This state action was reportedly denounced by the former National Chief Information Commissioner. Amnesty International has called on India to unequivocally condemn enforced disappearances", 
and to ensure that impartial investigations are conducted into mass graves in its Kashmir region. The Indian State Police confirms as many as 331 deaths while in custody and 111 enforced disappearances since 1989. A report from the Indian Central Bureau of Investigation CBI claimed that the seven people killed in 2000 by the Indian military, were innocent civilians. The Indian Army has decided to try the accused in the general court-martial. It was also reported that the killings that were allegedly committed in cold blood by the army, were actually in retaliation for the murder of 36 civilians Sikhs by militants at Chattisingpura in 2000. The official stance of the Indian Army was that, according to its own investigation, 97% of the reports about human rights abuses have been found to be fake or motivated. However, there have been at least one case where civilians have been killed in fake encounters by Indian Army personnel for cash rewards. According to a report by Human Rights Watch, Indian security forces have assaulted civilians during search operations, tortured and summarily executed detainees in custody and murdered civilians in reprisal attacks. Rape most often occurs during crackdowns, cordon and search operations during which men are held for identification in parks or schoolyards while security forces search their homes. In these situations, the security forces frequently engage in collective punishment against the civilian population, most frequently by beating or otherwise assaulting residents, and burning their homes. Rape is used as a means of targeting women whom the security forces accuse of being militant sympathizers. In raping them, the security forces are attempting to punish and humiliate the entire community. The allegation of mass rape incidents as well as forced disappearances are reflected in a Kashmiri short documentary film by an independent Kashmiri filmmaker, The Ocean of Tears produced by a non-governmental non-profit organization called the Public Service Broadcasting Trust of India and approved by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting India. The film depicts mass rape incidents in Kunan Pashpura and Shapian as facts and alleges that Indian security forces were responsible. Medisans Sands Frontiers conducted a research survey in 2005 that found 11.6% of the interviewees who took part had been victims of sexual abuse since 1989. This empirical study found that witnesses to rape in Kashmir was comparatively far higher than the other conflict zones such as Sierra Leone and Sri Lanka. 63% of people had heard of rape and 13% of the people had witnessed a rape. Dr. Seema Kazi holds the security forces more responsible for raping than militants due to rape by the former being larger in scale and frequency. In areas of militant activity the security forces use rape to destroy morale of Kashmiri resistance. Dr. Seema Kazi says these rapes cannot be ignored as rare occurrences nor should be ignored the documented acknowledgement of individual soldiers that they were ordered to rape. Kazi explains rape in Kashmir as a cultural weapon of war, in the particular context of Kashmir where an ethnic Muslim minority population is subject to the repressive dominance of a predominantly Hindu state. The sexual appropriation of Kashmiri women by state security forces exploits the cultural logic of rape whereby the sexual dishonor of individual women is coterminous with the subjection and subordination of Kashmiri men and the community at large. Former Chief Justice of Jammu and Kashmir High Court noted in his report on human rights in Kashmir, it is hard to escape the conclusion that the security forces who are overwhelmingly Hindu and Sikh, see it as their duty to beat an alien population into submission. Some surveys have found that in the Kashmir region itself, where the bulk of separatist and Indian military activity is concentrated, popular perception holds that the Indian armed forces are more to blame for human rights violations than the separatist groups. Amnesty International criticized the Indian military regarding an incident on the 22nd of April 1996, when several armed forces personnel forcibly entered the house of a 32-year-old woman in the village of Wawusa in the Rangrath district of Jammu and Kashmir. They reportedly molested her 12-year-old daughter and raped her other three daughters, aged 14, 16, and 18. When another woman attempted to prevent the soldiers from attacking her two daughters, she was beaten. Soldiers reportedly told her 17-year-old daughter to remove her clothes so that they could check whether she was hiding a gun. They molested her before leaving the house. According to an op-ed published in a BBC journal, the emphasis of the movement after 1989, soon shifted from nationalism to Islam. It also claimed that the minority community of Kashmiri Pandits, who have lived in Kashmir for centuries, were forced to leave their homeland. 
Reports by the Indian government state 219 Kashmiri Pandits were killed and around 140,000 migrated due to militancy while over 3,000 remained in the valley. The local organization of Pandits in Kashmir, Kashmir Pandit Sangarsh Samiti claimed that 399 Kashmiri Pandits were killed by insurgents. Al Jazeera states that 650 Pandits were murdered by militants. Human Rights Watch also blamed Pakistan for supporting militants in Kashmir. In same 2006 report, it says, There is considerable evidence that over many years Pakistan has provided Kashmiri militants with training, weapons, funding, and sanctuary. Pakistan remains accountable for abuses committed by militants that it has armed and trained. Our people were killed. I saw a girl tortured with cigarette butts. Another man had his eyes pulled out and his body hung on a tree. The armed separatists used a chainsaw to cut our bodies into pieces. It wasn't just the killing but the way they tortured and killed. The violence was condemned and labeled as ethnic cleansing in a 2006 resolution passed by the United States Congress. It stated that the Islamic terrorists infiltrated the region in 1989 and began an ethnic cleansing campaign to convert Kashmir into a Muslim state. According to the same resolution, since then nearly 400,000 pandits were either murdered or forced to leave their ancestral homes. According to a Hindu American Foundation report, the rights and religious freedom of Kashmiri Hindus have been severely curtailed since 1989, when there was an organized and systematic campaign by Islamist militants to cleanse Hindus from Kashmir. Less than 4,000 Kashmiri Hindus remain in the valley, reportedly living with daily threats of violence and terrorism. Sanjay Tikku, who heads the KPSS, an organization which looks after pandits who remain in the valley, says the situation is complex. On one hand the community did face intimidation and violence but on the other hand he says there was no genocide or mass murder as suggested by pandits who are based outside of Kashmir, the displaced pandits, many of whom continue to live in temporary refugee camps in Jammu and Delhi, are still unable to safely return to their homeland. The lead in this act of ethnic cleansing was initially taken by the Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front and the Hizbul Mujahideen. According to Indian media, all this happened at the instigation of Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence by a group of Kashmiri terrorist elements who were trained, armed and motivated by the ISI. Reportedly, organizations trained and armed by the ISI continued this ethnic cleansing until practically all the Kashmiri pandits were driven out after having been subjected to numerous indignities and brutalities such as rape of their women, torture, forcible seizure of property etc. The separatists in Kashmir deny these allegations. The Indian government is also trying to reinstate the displaced pandits in Kashmir. To hear, the district commander of a separatist Islamic group in Kashmir, stated, We want the Kashmiri pandits to come back. They are our brothers. We will try to protect them, but the majority of the pandits, who have been living in pitiable conditions in Jammu, believe that, until insurgency ceases to exist, return is not possible. Mustafa Kemal, brother of Union Minister Farooq Abdullah, blamed security forces, former Jammu and Kashmir Governor Jagmohan and PDP leader Mufti Sayyid for forcing the migration of Kashmiri pandits from the valley. Jagmohan denies these allegations. Pro-India politician Abdul Rashid says pandits forced the migration on themselves so Muslims can be killed. He says the plan was to leave Muslims alone and bulldoze them freely. The CIA has reported that at least 506,000 people from Indian-administered Kashmir are internally displaced, about half of who are Hindu pandits. The United Nations Commission on Human Rights UNCR reports that there are roughly 1.5 million refugees from Indian-administered Kashmir, the bulk of who arrived in Pakistan-administered Kashmir and in Pakistan after the situation on the Indian side worsened in 1989 insurgency. Topic. Pakistan administered Kashmir Topic. Azad Kashmir Harvardian Mehboob Makhdoumi writes that human rights violations in Pakistani administered part of Kashmir are not comparable with human rights violations in Indian administered Kashmir. The 2010 Chatham House opinion poll of Azad Kashmir's people found that overall concerns about human rights abuses in Azad Kashmir was 
The district where concern over human rights abuses was greatest was Bimber where 32% of people expressed concern over human rights abuses. The lowest was in the district of Sudanati where concern over human rights abuses was a mere 5%. Claims of religious discrimination and restrictions on religious freedom in Azad Kashmir have been made against Pakistan. The country is also accused of systemic suppression of free speech and demonstrations against the government. UNHCR reported that a number of Islamist militant groups, including Al-Qaeda, operate from bases in Pakistani-administered Kashmir with the tacit permission of ISI There have also been several allegations of human rights abuse. In 2006, Human Rights Watch accused ISI and the military of systemic torture with the purpose of punishing errant politicians, political activists and journalists in Azad Kashmir. According to Brad Adams, the Asia director at Human Rights Watch, the problems of human rights abuses in Azad Kashmir were not rampant, but they needed to be addressed, and that the severity of human rights issues in Indian-administered Kashmir were much, much, much greater. A report titled, Kashmir, Present Situation and Future Prospects. Submitted to the European Parliament by Emma Nicholson, was critical of the lack of human rights, justice, democracy, and Kashmiri representation in the Pakistan National Assembly. According to the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, Pakistan's ISI operates in Pakistan-administered Kashmir and is accused of involvement in extensive surveillance, arbitrary arrests, torture, and murder. The 2008 report by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees determined that Pakistan-administered Kashmir was not free. According to Shaukat Ali, chairman of the International Kashmir Alliance, on one hand Pakistan claims to be the champion of the right of self-determination of the Kashmiri people, but she has denied the same rights under its controlled parts of Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. After the 2011 elections, Azad Kashmir Prime Minister Sardar Atik Ahmad Khan stated that there were mistakes in the voters' list which have raised questions about the credibility of the elections. In December 1993, the blasphemy laws of Pakistan were extended to Pakistan administered Kashmir. The area is ruled directly through a chief executive, Lt. Gen. Muhammad Shafiq, appointed by Islamabad with a 26-member Northern Areas Council, UNCR reports that the status of women in Pakistani-administered Kashmir is similar to that of women in Pakistan. They are not granted equal rights under the law, and their educational opportunities and choice of marriage partner remain circumscribed. Domestic violence, forced marriage, and other forms of abuse continue to be issues of concern. In May 2007, the United Nations and other aid agencies temporarily suspended their work after suspected Islamists mounted an arson attack on the home of two aid workers after the organizations had received warnings against hiring women. However, honor killings and rape occur less frequently than in other areas of Pakistan. Scholar Sumantra Bose comments that the uprising remained restricted to the Indian side and did not spill over into Pakistani administered Kashmir despite a lack of democratic freedoms on the Pakistani side. Bose offers a number of possible explanations for this. Azad Kashmir's strong pro-Pakistan allegiances and a relatively smaller population are suggested as reasons. But Bose believes that a stronger explanation was that Pakistan had itself been a military bureaucratic state for most of its history without stable democratic institutions. According to Bose, the Kashmiri Muslims had higher expectations from India which turned out to be a moderately successful democracy and it was in this context that Kashmiri Muslim rage spilled over after the rigging of the elections in 1987. The residents of Azad Kashmir are also mostly Punjabi, differing in ethnicity from Kashmiris in the Indian-administered section of the state. <laughs> Gilgit Baltistan The main demand of the people of Gilgit Baltistan is constitutional status for the region as a fifth province of Pakistan. However, Pakistan claims that Gilgit Baltistan cannot be given constitutional status due to Pakistan's commitment to the 1948 UN resolution. In 2007, the International Crisis Group stated that Almost six decades after Pakistan's independence, the constitutional status of the federally administered northern areas Gilgit and Baltistan, once part of the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir and now under Pakistani control, remains undetermined, with political autonomy a distant dream. 
The region's inhabitants are embittered by Islamabad's unwillingness to devolve powers in real terms to its elected representatives, and a nationalist movement, which seeks independence, is gaining ground. The rise of sectarian extremism is an alarming consequence of this denial of basic political rights. A two day conference on Gilgit Baltistan was held on 8 9 April 2008 at the European Parliament in Brussels under the auspices of the International Kashmir Alliance. Several members of the European Parliament expressed concern over human rights violations in Gilgit Baltistan and urged the government of Pakistan to establish democratic institutions and the rule of law in the area. In 2009, the Pakistani government implemented an autonomy package for Gilgit Baltistan, which entails rights similar to those of Pakistan's other provinces. Gilgit Baltistan thus gains province like status without actually being conferred such status constitutionally. Direct rule by Islamabad has been replaced by an elected legislative assembly under a chief minister. The 2009 reform has not satisfied locals who demand citizenship rights and it has continued to leave Gilgit Baltistan's constitutional status within Pakistan undefined, although it has added to the self-identification of the territory. According to Antia Mato Bowses, the PPP-led Pakistani government had attempted a compromise between its official position on Kashmir and the demands of a population where the majority may have pro-Pakistan sentiments. There has been criticism and opposition to this move in Pakistan, India, and Pakistan-administered Kashmir. The move has been dubbed a cover-up to hide the real mechanics of power, which allegedly are under the direct control of the Pakistani federal government. The package was opposed by Pakistani Kashmiri politicians who claimed that the integration of Gilgit Baltistan into Pakistan would undermine their case for the independence of Kashmir from India. 300 activists from Kashmiri groups protested during the first Gilgit Baltistan Legislative Assembly elections, with some carrying banners reading, Pakistan's expansionist designs in Gilgit Baltistan are unacceptable. In December 2009, activists from nationalist Kashmiri groups staged a protest in Muzaffarabad to condemn the alleged rigging of elections and the killing of an 18-year-old student. <laughs> <laughs> Map issues As with other disputed territories, each government issues maps depicting their claims in Kashmir territory, regardless of actual control. Due to India's Criminal Law Amendment Act, 1961, it is illegal in India to exclude all or part of Kashmir from a map or to publish any map that differs from those of the Survey of India. It is illegal in Pakistan not to include the state of Jammu and Kashmir as disputed territory, as permitted by the United Nations. Non-participants often use the line of control and the line of actual control as the depicted boundaries, as is done in the CIA World Factbook, while the region is often marked out in hashmarks. When Microsoft released a map in Windows 95 and MapPoint 2002, a controversy arose because it did not show all of Kashmir as part of India as per the Indian claim. All neutral and Pakistani companies claim to follow the UN's map and over 90% of all maps containing the territory of Kashmir show it as disputed territory. Recent developments. India continues to assert its sovereignty or rights over the entire region of Kashmir, while Pakistan maintains that it is a disputed territory. Pakistan argues that the status quo cannot be considered as a solution and further insists on a UN-sponsored plebiscite. And officially, the Pakistani leadership has indicated that they would be willing to accept alternatives such as a demilitarized Kashmir, if sovereignty of Azad Kashmir was to be extended over the Kashmir Valley, or the Chenab formula, by which India would retain parts of Kashmir on its side of the Chenab River, and Pakistan the other side—effectively repartitioning Kashmir on communal lines. The problem with the proposal is that the population of the Pakistan-administered portion of Kashmir is for the most part ethnically, linguistically, and culturally different from the Valley of Kashmir, a part of Indian-administered Kashmir. Partition based on the Chenab formula is opposed by some Kashmiri politicians, although others, including Sajad Lone, have suggested that the non-Muslim part of Jammu and Kashmir be separated from Kashmir and handed to India. Some political analysts say that the Pakistan state policy shift and mellowing of its aggressive stance may have to do with its total failure in the Kargil War and the subsequent 9-11 attacks. 
These events put pressure on Pakistan to alter its position on terrorism. Many neutral parties to the dispute have noted that the UN resolution on Kashmir is no longer relevant. The European Union holds the view that the plebiscite is not in Kashmiris's interest. The report notes that the UN conditions for such a plebiscite have not been, and can no longer be, met by Pakistan. The Hurriyat Conference observed in 2003 that a plebiscite is no longer an option. Besides the popular factions that support one or other of the parties, there is a third faction which supports independence and withdrawal of both India and Pakistan. These have been the respective stands of the parties for a long while, and there have been no significant changes over the years. As a result, all efforts to solve the conflict have so far proved futile. Revelations made on 24 September 2013 by the former Indian Army Chief General V. K. Singh claim that the state politicians of Jammu and Kashmir are funded by the Army Secret Service to keep the general public calm and that this activity has been going on since partition, in a 2001 report entitled, Pakistan's Role in the Kashmir Insurgency. From the American Rand Corporation, the think tank noted that the nature of the Kashmir conflict has been transformed from what was originally a secular, locally based struggle conducted via the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front JKLF, to one that is now largely carried out by foreign militants and rationalized in pan-Islamic religious terms. The majority of militant organizations are composed of foreign mercenaries, mostly from the Pakistani Punjab. In 2010, with the support of its intelligence agencies, Pakistan again boosted Kashmir militants, and recruitment of Mujahideen in the Pakistani state of Punjab has increased. In 2011, the FBI revealed that Pakistan's spy agency ISI paid millions of dollars into a United States-based non-governmental organization to influence politicians and opinion makers on the Kashmir issue and arrested Syed Ghulam Nabi FAI. The Freedom in the World 2006 report categorized Indian-administered Kashmir as partly free and Pakistan-administered Kashmir, as well as the country of Pakistan, as not free. India claims that contrary to popular belief, a large proportion of the Jammu and Kashmir populace wishes to remain with India. A Mori survey found that within Indian-administered Kashmir, 61% of respondents said they felt they would be better off as Indian citizens, with 33% saying that they did not know, and the remaining 6% favouring Pakistani citizenship. However, this support for India was mainly in the Ladakh and Jammu regions, not the Kashmir Valley, where only 9% of the respondents said that they would be better off with India. According to a 2007 poll conducted by the Centre for the Study of Developing Societies in New Delhi, 87% of respondents in the Kashmir Valley prefer independence over union with India or Pakistan. However, a survey by Chatham House in both Indian and Pakistani administered Kashmir found that support for independence stood at 43% and 44% respectively. The 2005 Kashmir earthquake, which killed over 80,000 people, led to India and Pakistan finalizing negotiations for the opening of a road for disaster relief through Kashmir. Topic: <laughs> Efforts to end the crisis. The 9-11 attacks on the United States resulted in the U.S. government wanting to restrain militancy in the world, including Pakistan. They urged Islamabad to cease infiltration, which continued to this day, by Islamist militants into Indian-administered Kashmir. In December 2001, a terrorist attack on the Indian parliament linked to Pakistan resulted in war threats, massive troop deployments, and international fears of a nuclear war in the subcontinent. After intensive diplomatic efforts by other countries, India and Pakistan began to withdraw troops from the international border on 10 June 2002, and negotiations restarted. From 26 November 2003, India and Pakistan agreed to maintain a ceasefire along the undisputed international border, the disputed line of control, an actual ground position line near the Siachen Glacier. This was the first such total ceasefire declared by both powers in nearly 15 years. In February 2004, Pakistan increased pressure on Pakistanis fighting in Indian-administered Kashmir to adhere to the ceasefire. Their neighbors launched several other mutual confidence-building measures. Restarting the bus service between the Indian and Pakistani-administered Kashmir has helped defuse tensions between the countries while both India and Pakistan have decided to cooperate on economic fronts. 
In 2005, General Musharraf as well as other Pakistani leaders sought to resolve the Kashmir issue through the Chenab Formula Road Map. Based on the Dixon Plan, the Chenab Formula assigns Ladakh to India, Gilgit Baltistan GB to Pakistan, proposes a plebiscite in the Kashmir Valley and splits Jammu into two halves. On 5 December 2006, Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf told an Indian TV channel that Pakistan would give up its claim on Kashmir if India accepted some of his peace proposals, including a phased withdrawal of troops, self-governance for locals, no changes in the borders of Kashmir, and a joint supervision mechanism involving India, Pakistan, and Kashmir. Musharraf stated that he was ready to give up the United Nations resolutions regarding Kashmir. Topic: 2008 militant attacks. In the week of the 10th of March 2008, 17 people were wounded when a blast hit the region's only highway overpass located near the civil secretariat, the seat of government of Indian-controlled Kashmir, and the region's high court. A gun battle between security forces and militants fighting against Indian rule left five people dead and two others injured on the 23rd of March 2008. The battle began when security forces raided a house on the outskirts of the capital city of Srinagar housing militants. The Indian Army has been carrying out cordon and search operations against militants in Indian-administered Kashmir since the violence broke out in 1989. While the authorities say 43,000 people have been killed in the violence, various human rights groups and non governmental organizations have put the figure at twice that number. According to the Government of India Home Ministry, 2008 was the year with the lowest civilian casualties in 20 years, with 89 deaths, compared to a high of 1,413 in 1996. In 2008, 85 security personnel died compared to 613 in 2001, while 102 militants were killed. The human rights situation improved, with only one custodial death, and no custodial disappearances. Many analysts say Pakistan's preoccupation with jihadis within its own borders explains the relative calm. Topic: 2008 Kashmir protests. Massive demonstrations occurred after plans by the Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir state government to transfer 100 acres 0 .40 square kilometers of land to a trust which runs the Hindu Amarnath Shrine in the Muslim-majority Kashmir Valley. This land was to be used to build a shelter to house Hindu pilgrims temporarily during their annual pilgrimage to the Amarnath Temple. Such demonstrations have been aloof of the fact that the India government very regularly undertakes activities for upliftment of Muslim community as a secular government and very regularly donates lands and other properties to the systemized WAQF boards. Indian security forces and the Indian army responded quickly to keep order. More than 40 unarmed protesters were killed and at least 300 were detained. The largest protests saw more than a half million people waving Pakistani flags and crying for freedom at a rally on 18 August, according to Time magazine. Pro-independence Kashmiri leader Mirwais Umar Farooq warned that the peaceful uprising could lead to an upsurge in violence if India's heavy-handed crackdown on protests was not restrained. The United Nations expressed concern at India's response to peaceful protests and urged investigations be launched against Indian security personnel who had taken part in the crackdown. Separatists and political party workers were believed to be behind stone throwing incidents, which have led to retaliatory fire from the police. An auto rickshaw laden with stones meant for distribution was seized by the police in March 2009. Following the unrest in 2008, secessionist movements got a boost. 2008 Kashmir elections State elections were held in Indian-administered Kashmir in seven phases, starting on 17 November and finishing on 24 December 2008. In spite of calls by separatists for a boycott, an unusually high turnout of more than 60% was recorded. The National Conference Party, which was founded by Sheikh Abdullah and is regarded as pro-India, emerged with a majority of the seats. On 30 December, the Congress Party and the National Conference agreed to form a coalition government, with Omar Abdullah as chief minister. 
On 5 January 2009, Abdullah was sworn in as the 11th Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir. In March 2009, Abdullah stated that only 800 militants were active in the state and out of these, only 30% were Kashmiris. Topic: 2009 Kashmir protests. In 2009, protests started over the alleged rape and murder of two young women in Shopian in South Kashmir. Suspicion pointed towards the police as the perpetrators. A judicial enquiry by a retired High Court official confirmed the suspicion, but a CBI enquiry reversed their conclusion. This gave fresh impetus to popular agitation against India. Significantly, the unity between the separatist parties was lacking this time. 2010 Kashmir unrest The 2010 Kashmir unrest was series of protests in the Muslim-majority Kashmir Valley in Jammu and Kashmir which started in June 2010. These protests involved the Quit Jammu Kashmir movement launched by the Hurriyat Conference led by Syed Ali Shah Jalani and Mirwais Umar Farooq, who had called for the complete demilitarization of Jammu and Kashmir. The All Parties Hurriyat Conference made this call to protest, citing human rights abuses by Indian troops. Chief Minister Omar Abdullah attributed the 2010 unrest to the fake encounter staged by the military in Makkal. Protesters shouted pro-independence slogans, defied curfews, attacked security forces with stones and burnt police vehicles and government buildings. The Jammu and Kashmir police and Indian paramilitary forces fired live ammunition on the protesters, resulting in 112 deaths, including many teenagers. The protests subsided after the Indian government announced a package of measures aimed at defusing the tensions in September 2010. 2014 Jammu and Kashmir elections The Jammu and Kashmir Legislative Assembly election, 2014 was held in Indian state of Jammu and Kashmir in five phases from 25 November to 20 December 2014. Despite repeated boycott calls by separatist Hurriyat leaders, elections recorded highest voters turnout in last 25 years, that is more than 65% which is more than usual voting percentage in other states of India. Phase-wise voting percentage is as follows. The European Parliament, on the behalf of European Union, welcomed the smooth conduct of the state legislative elections in the Jammu and Kashmir. The EU in its message said, The high voter turnout figure proves that democracy is firmly rooted in India. The EU would like to congratulate India and its democratic system for conduct of fair elections, unmarred by violence, in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The European Parliament also takes cognizance of the fact that a large number of Kashmiri voters turned out despite calls for the boycott of elections by certain separatist forces. 2014. In October 2014, Indian and Pakistani troops traded gunfire over their border in the divided Himalayan region of Kashmir, killing at least four civilians and worsening tensions between the longtime rivals, officials on both sides have said. The small arms and mortar exchanges, which Indian officials called the worst violation of a 2003 ceasefire, left 18 civilians wounded in India and another three in Pakistan. Tens of thousands of people fled their homes on both sides after the violence erupted on 5 October. Official reports state that nine civilians in Pakistan and seven in India were killed in three nights of fighting. 2016. July 2016 On 8 July 2016, a popular militant leader Burhan Muzaffar Wani was cornered by the security forces and killed. Following his death, protests and demonstrations have taken root leading to an amplified instability in the Kashmir Valley. Curfews have been imposed in all 10 districts of Kashmir and over 40 civilians died and over 2,000 injured in clashes with the police. More than 600 have pellet injuries who may lose their eyesight. To prevent volatile rumors, cell phone and internet services have been blocked, and newspapers have also been restricted in many parts of the state. 
Topic: <laughs> September 2016. An attack by four militants on an Indian Army base on 18 September 2016, also known as the 2016 Uri attack, resulted in the death of 19 soldiers as well as the militants themselves. Although no one claimed responsibility for the attack, the militant group Jaish e Muhammad was suspected of involvement by the Indian authorities. The Indians were particularly shaken by the event which they blamed on Islamabad. Response took various forms, including the postponement of the 19th SAARC summit, asking the Russian government to call off a joint military exercise with Pakistan, and the Indian Motion Picture Producers Association decision to suspend work with Pakistan. On the Pakistani side, military alertness was raised and some Pakistan International Airlines flights suspended. The Pakistani government denied any role in cross-border terrorism, and called on the United Nations and the international community to investigate atrocities it alleged have been committed by the security forces in Indian-ruled Kashmir. <laughs> United States positions on the Kashmir conflict In an interview with Joe Klein of Time magazine in October 2008, Barack Obama expressed his intention to try to work with India and Pakistan to resolve the crisis. He said he had talked to Bill Clinton about it, as Clinton has experience as a mediator. In an editorial in The Washington Times, Selig S. Harrison, director of the Asia Program at the Center for International Policy and a senior scholar of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars called it Obama's first foreign policy mistake. In an editorial, the Australian called Obama's idea to appoint a presidential negotiator, a very stupid and dangerous move indeed. In an editorial in Forbes, Rehan Salam, associate editor for The Atlantic, noted, The smartest thing President Obama could do on Kashmir is probably nothing. We have to hope that India and Pakistan can work out their differences on Kashmir on their own. The Boston Globe called the idea of appointing Bill Clinton as an envoy to Kashmir, a mistake. President Obama subsequently appointed Richard Holbrook as special envoy to Pakistan and Afghanistan. President Asif Ali Zardari hoped that Holbrook would help mediate to resolve the Kashmir issue. Kashmir was later removed from Holbrook's mandate, eliminating Kashmir from his job description is seen as a significant diplomatic concession to India that reflects increasingly warm ties between the country and the United States." The Washington Post noted in a report. Brajesh Mishra, India's former national security advisor, was quoted in the same report as saying that, "...no matter what government is in place, India is not going to relinquish control of Jammu and Kashmir. That is written in stone and cannot be changed." According to the Financial Times, India has warned Obama that he risks barking up the wrong tree if he seeks to broker a settlement between Pakistan and India over Kashmir. In July 2009, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Robert O. Blake Jr. stated that the United States had no plans to appoint any special envoy to settle the dispute, calling it an issue which needed to be sorted out bilaterally by India and Pakistan. According to Don this will be interpreted in Pakistan as an endorsement of India's position on Kashmir that no outside power has any role in this dispute. In 2002, former U.S. President, Bill Clinton described Kashmir as the most dangerous place in the world. He averted a nuclear war between India and Pakistan over the issue of Kashmir according to former U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot. Talbot reveals in his book Engaging India, Diplomacy, Democracy and the Bomb that India and Pakistan came very close to a nuclear war in 1999. According to Talbot, before Clinton met with Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif in 1999 to discuss the issue, U.S. National Security Advisor Sandy Berger told Clinton that he could be heading into the single most important meeting with a foreign leader of his entire presidency. India and Pakistan conducted nuclear tests in 1998 and the two countries each hold significant numbers of nuclear warheads. India and Pakistan fought two wars over the issue of Kashmir in 1947 and 1965. These two neighbours came dangerously close to a third war during the Kargil conflict in 1999. <laughs> Issues surrounding plebiscite
Topic: <laughs> UN Resolution The United Nations Security Council Resolution 47 was passed by United Nations Security Council under Chapter 6 of UN Charter. Resolutions passed under Chapter 6 of UN Charter are considered non-binding and have no mandatory enforceability as opposed to the resolutions passed under Chapter 7. On 24 January 1957 the UN Security Council reaffirmed the 1948 resolution, the Security Council, reaffirming its previous resolution to the effect, "...that the final disposition of the state of Jammu and Kashmir will be made in accordance with the will of the people expressed through the democratic method of a free and impartial plebiscite conducted under the auspices of United Nations." Further declared that any action taken by the Constituent Assembly formed in Kashmir would not constitute disposition of the state in accordance with the above principles. In March 2001, the then Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan during his visit to India and Pakistan, remarked that Kashmir resolutions are only advisory recommendations and comparing with those on East Timor and Iraq was like comparing apples and oranges, since those resolutions were passed under Chapter 7, which make it enforceable by UNSC. In 2003, then Pakistan President Pervez Musharraf said Pakistan was willing to consider alternative bilateral options to resolve the dispute other than solely UN resolutions. In 2010, United States Ambassador to India, Timothy J. Romer said that Kashmir is an internal issue of India and not to be discussed on international level rather it should be solved by bilateral talks between India and Pakistan. He said, the US President, Barack Obama, I think was very articulate on this issue of Kashmir. This is an internal issue for India. India alleges that Pakistan failed to fulfill the pre-conditions by withdrawing its troops from the Kashmir region as was required under the same UN resolution of 13 August 1948 which discussed the plebiscite. Separatist Hurriyat leader Syed Ali Shah Jalani said, first of all when they say Kashmir is an internal issue, it is against the reality. The issue of Jammu and Kashmir is an international issue and it should be solved. As long as promises made to us are not fulfilled, this issue will remain unsolved. Topic: <inaudible> Instrument of Accession. The Instrument of Accession of the State of Jammu and Kashmir to the Union of India was signed by Maharaja Hari Singh, erstwhile ruler, on the 25th of October 1947 and executed on the 27th of October 1947 between the ruler of Kashmir and the Governor General of India. This was a legal act and completely valid in terms of the Government of India Act 1935, Indian Independence Act 1947, and under international law. Hence the accession of the Jammu and Kashmir state was total and irrevocable. The Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir had unanimously ratified the instrument of accession to India duly adopting a constitution for the state endorsing perpetual merger of Jammu and Kashmir with the Union of India. The Constituent Assembly lawfully represented wish of Kashmiri people at that time. Indian authorities claim that the 65% voter turnout in Kashmir elections is an endorsement of the instrument of accession, and Indian democracy. Alistair Lamb writes that there is no dispute on the fact that the instrument of accession was presented to the world as provisional and conditional on the wishes of the people of the state. Therefore, if the people of Kashmir were to vote for not staying with India then any document relating to accession signed by the Maharaja would become null and void. Indian commentators have endeavoured to argue that the plebiscite proposal was personal to Mountbatten the plebiscite proposal was not personal to Mountbatten since he was explicitly acting on behalf of his government, that it was ex gratia and not binding on the subsequent Indian administrations. The actual fact was that the plebiscite policy had long been established before the crisis in Kashmir and was an inherent part of the process by which British India had been partitioned into the dominions of India and Pakistan. A. G. Norani also writes that the accession of Kashmir to India was strictly conditional. He says that Kashmiri rights for self-determination are not derived from the UN resolutions but their right is actually engrafted as a condition on the instrument of accession. He writes that state elections do not fulfill this condition since Mountbatten mentioned a reference to the people of the state and not elections to the assembly. 
According to a 1994 report by the International Commission of Jurists the people of Jammu and Kashmir still have not been able to exercise their right to self-determination which became available to them at partition. Topic: Article 370 Article 370 of the Indian Constitution is a provision that grants special autonomous status to Jammu and Kashmir. The article is drafted in Part 21 of the Constitution, which relates to temporary, transitional and special provisions. Article 370 is the only link that connects Jammu and Kashmir to India. To implement a plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir one has to amend or abolish the Article 370, which is very complex procedure. The leaders of Kashmir oppose any such measure. Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir Mufti Muhammad Sayyid said, Even Indian Parliament does not have power to scrap Article 370, which grants special status to Jammu and Kashmir under Indian constitution. The High Court of Jammu and Kashmir has ruled that the Article 370 cannot be abrogated, repealed, or even amended. It explained that the Clause 3 of the article conferred power to the state's constituent assembly to recommend to the president on the matter of the repeal of the article. Since the constituent assembly did not make such a recommendation before its dissolution in 1957, the Article 370 has taken on the features of a permanent provision, despite being titled a temporary provision in the Constitution. Article 370 has emerged as the biggest obstacle in front of plebiscite because of its complex procedure of amendment and opposition from the leaders of Jammu and Kashmir. Article 370 allows its own death by permitting plebiscite. Article 370 was drafted while negotiations with Pakistan were still on. When Pakistan objected to Article 370 at the UN Commission Garija Shankar Bajpai, who was Secretary General of Ministry of External Affairs, wrote to UNCIP in 1949 that Article 370 did not preclude plebiscite. Krishna Menon said to the UN Security Council in 1957 that if people of Kashmir voted to not stay with India then India's duty at that time would be to adopt those constitutional procedures which would enable separation of Kashmir from India. That procedure is contained in Clause 3 of Article 370, a presidential order to declare that the Article 370 will cease to be operative. A. G. Norani argues that it is perfectly acceptable for a Kashmiri to contest the elections and recognize the constitution while remaining committed to plebiscite and independence and the reason for this is that the constitution itself leaves the disposition of Kashmir open. Nehru's promise After accession of Kashmir to India in October 1947 then Prime Minister of India Jawaharlal Nehru made some statements in media and in various telegrams regarding plebiscite in Kashmir, in telegram number 413 dated 28 October 1947 addressed to Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nehru wrote that government of India and Pakistan should make a joint request to UNO to undertake a plebiscite in Kashmir at the earliest possible date." Nehru's statement in the Indian Parliament, 26 June 1952, I want to stress that it is only the people of Kashmir who can decide the future of Kashmir. It is not that we have merely said that to the United Nations and to the people of Kashmir, it is our conviction and one that is borne out by the policy that we have pursued, not only in Kashmir but everywhere. I started with the presumption that it is for the people of Kashmir to decide their own future. We will not compel them. In that sense, the people of Kashmir are sovereign. In his statement in the Lok Sabha on 31 March 1955 as published in Hindustan Times New Delhi on 1 April, 1955, Pandit Nehru said, "...Kashmir is perhaps the most difficult of all these problems between India and Pakistan. We should also remember that Kashmir is not a thing to be bandied between India and Pakistan but it has a soul of its own and an individuality of its own." Nothing can be done without the good will and consent of the people of Kashmir." There was also a white paper on Kashmir published by Indian government regarding plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir in 1948. There are many such instances where Nehru made such remarks regarding plebiscite in Jammu and Kashmir. 
Pakistan and separatist Hurriyat leaders repeatedly demand that Indian government should fulfill Nehru's promise. Position of the Indian authorities on Nehru's promise. The Indian government takes the position that Nehru himself backed off from his promise in the late 1950s. Although he was prime minister for 17 years, he made no serious attempt for a plebiscite. His promises have been taken as a good political move. The reason for not holding plebiscite was given by India's defence minister, Krishnan Menon, who said, Kashmir would vote to join Pakistan and no Indian government responsible for agreeing to plebiscite would survive. Indian authorities say that Nehru's telegrams and speeches have no legal importance, nor it is compulsory to apply them as they were never passed by the Parliament of India. The White Paper on Kashmir also does not have any legal importance as it was published in 1948 while the Constitution of India came into force into 1950 and defined Kashmir as an integral part of India as well as protecting the unity and integrity of India. Constitution of India doesn't has any provision for plebiscite and 1948 White Paper was against Constitution of India so it automatically got abolished. Indian authorities also say that, Nehru is not current Prime Minister of India, and policies are made on the basis of views of current Prime Minister and his cabinet which must get nod by both Houses of Parliament of India. Any Prime Minister of India can't make decision of plebiscite unilaterally. Bill of plebiscite must be passed in both Houses of Parliament of India with a massive two-thirds road majority, then it requires assent by President of India, and if that decision is against basic structure of Indian constitution then Supreme Court of India can outlaw or abolish that decision. Preamble and Article 3 of Part 2 of Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir says Jammu and Kashmir is and shall be an integral part of the Union of India. This constitution has been adopted by elected Jammu and Kashmir Constituent Assembly in 1956 when Nehru was Prime Minister of India. Daughter of Nehru, Indira Gandhi and his grandson Rajiv Gandhi were Prime Ministers of India but they themselves never did any attempt to implement their forefathers' promise. Instead Indira Gandhi made 1975 Indira Sheikh Accord with Sheikh Abdullah which vanished all possibilities of plebiscite. Topic. Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir Preamble of Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir is as written in box. Article 3 of Part 2 of Constitution of Jammu and Kashmir also says that Jammu and Kashmir is and shall be an integral part of the Union of India. Ram Jethmalani, prominent lawyer, former Union Minister and Chairman of Kashmir Committee said in November 2014. The constitution of this state Jammu and Kashmir was not formulated by the Constituent Assembly of India, but by its Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir. That was a plebiscite. It is the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir which incorporated some provisions of the Indian constitution. You Kashmiris are not living under the Constitution of India but under the Constitution which was framed by the Constituent Assembly of Jammu and Kashmir which has willingly accepted a part of the Indian Constitution, and in a way, enjoyed a plebiscite. However, the resolutions 91 and 122 passed by United Nations, state that the formation of Jammu and Kashmir Constituent Assembly, or its activities, would not be considered to be a substitute for a free and impartial plebiscite, which is required for a final disposition of the state. Outlook survey In 1995 the first ever opinion poll was conducted in the Kashmir Valley by Mode which had been commissioned by Outlook. Altogether 504 adults 337 men, 176 women were interviewed in Srinagar, Sapur, Baramulla, Bandipura, and Anantnag areas. 72% of respondents favored independence, 19% favored Pakistan and only 7% favored a solution within Indian sovereignty. 80% of respondents said that a free and fair election would definitely not help solve the Kashmir problem while only 4% said that a free and fair election could help resolve the Kashmir conflict. Private survey 
London-based leading think tank Royal Institute of International Affairs also known as Chatham House, conducted a survey both in Pakistan-administered Kashmir and Indian-administered Kashmir and released it in its report Kashmir, Paths to Peace in May 2010. It found that 50% of people in Pakistan's side of Kashmir favoured the accession of the entire state to Pakistan, 44% of people favoured independence, 1% wanted the accession of the entire state to accede to India while 1% favoured the status quo. In the Indian side of Kashmir, 28% of people expressed a desire for the entire state to accede to India, 19% favoured the status quo, 43% wanted independence while 2% said they wanted the entire state to join Pakistan. The survey showed that only 2% of the respondents on the Indian side favoured joining Pakistan and most such views were confined to Srinagar and Bujam districts. In six of the districts surveyed late last year by researchers, not a single person favoured annexation with Pakistan, a notion that remains the bedrock for the hardline separatist campaign in Kashmir. The survey also showed that only 1% of the respondents on the Pakistani side favoured joining India. In four of the seven surveyed districts of Pakistani Kashmir, the option of merging with India found no support while this option had a support rate of only 1-3% in the remaining three districts. However, views are highly polarized in each region. The main area of unrest has always been the predominantly Muslim-majority Kashmir Valley, where the support level for independence varies between 74% to 95% as found by the survey while support for accession with India varies between 2% to 22%. However, Hindu-majority Jammu and Buddhist-majority Ladakh express high levels of satisfaction with Indian rule. This 2010 survey too demonstrated that trend, with more than half the respondents on Indian side saying the elections had improved chances for peace. Later in 2014, Jammu and Kashmir elections recorded highest percentage of voters' turnout. Survey said, These results support the already widespread view that the plebiscite options are likely to offer no solution to the dispute. The results aren't surprising at all. I feel they re-emphasize the need to look beyond traditional positions and evaluate the contours of a solution grounded in today's realities," said Sajad Lone on this survey, a former ally of the Hurriyat who unsuccessfully contested the 2009 Indian general elections but won in 2014 Jammu and Kashmir assembly elections. See also History of Jammu and Kashmir United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan Indian White Paper on Jammu and Kashmir All Parties Hurriyat Conference Insurgency in Jammu and Kashmir India-Pakistan Relations Indo-Pakistani Wars and Conflicts Notes <laughs> <laughs>